We've all been chatting already. Very cool. What you talking about, Willis? All right. Good afternoon from Lakeland, Florida. Hey, Kevin. How you doing, man? Thanks, Simon. Boom. Good day from Gob Gobble, Gobble, Oregon. <laughs> Gobble, Oregon. <laughs> GDP of top cities in the world. Uh, world one. I real time. Very interesting. In real time live stream, like the deck clock. <laughs> Good evening from Texas. Here comes the fun. All right. Greetings, buddy. Old pal. Right on. All right. Well, I thought I would do a quick kind of recap of the lumber story real quick. Um, not a whole lot of good news as far as that goes from the lumber story. And if you've been tracking or following the lumber story, at least from here on the YouTube channel on the Uneducated Economist, I don't know if I'm going to have a really a lot of new information for you, but there's definitely some good stuff that it's happening here. Um, just real quick, kind of what happened with the lumber story over the last couple of years here. Um, if you've been tracking, you know, if you've been following my story, you already heard this part, but if you're new to the channel or just new to this live stream and you're just checking in for the first time, what happened with lumber was, is back in 2018, there was an overbuild or not an overbuild an oversupply taking place. Now, mainly I use the excuse of the British Columbia area going into a uh, salvage mode due to the bug in station that had taken place up there well the salvage mode had them producing a lot more lumber than what they would typically do and they were sending that down to the United States now that was back in 2018 now the salvage mode had come to an end and a lot of curtailments started to take place when the prices had fallen they were at 650 per thousand they dropped all the way down into like the two or three hundred per thousand it was one of the biggest drops in lumber at that time then in history right now this was 2019, lumber prices were really low and mills were in massive curtailments all over the place. And I was reporting on that on this channel all throughout 2019. Well then when 2020 hit, we got stimulus packages, people were moving out from the cities, moving out to the country, people were wanting to build decks and fences and gazebos and raise garden beds and remodel the house and there was a huge demand for lumber that was taking place in 2020. This was during a time when there was low inventory in mill curtailments that had permanently pulled a lot of production off the market. So when the stimulus packages came out and everybody was running out there trying to you know, buy this lumber to remodel the house or build a house or all the demand for lumber that was taking place zapped all the inventory. Well, that shot lumber prices up to the to the all-time highs of 1700 per thousand. And this is really where everybody started getting very confused. Now, they wanted to start to point at the, the finger at the mill, saying they were doing this on purpose for manipulation. Uh, a lot of people were blaming it on the Federal Reserve, saying that it was all the money printer. Everybody had all their reasonings and excuses for it. I was one of the few people who had been reporting on it the entire time who was saying no wait a minute this is mill curtailments inventory depletion yes the stimulus packages from the federal reserve and the government in the money printer go burr kind of stuff did cause prices to go up but it was really the inelastic demand that was coming from the builders out there once they have started in on a project they have no choice they cannot back out they have to go forward with it and so purchasing lumber became very difficult when they couldn't source it out and they were finding it from ever further distances and paying an incredibly high price for it that's really what drove the lumber prices up to their all-time highs now at 1700 per thousand those mills were pumping out a lot of lumber like all the mills wanted to push out as much lumber as they possibly could when you're at 1700 per thousand i mean you have to think this is like i mean 500 per thousand would have been a normal price and it was at 1700 right so when the mills started pushing out a lot of lumber, well, not a lot of people wanted to be buying at 1700 per thousand. And so when this lumber started getting produced, it oversupplied and it caused the prices to crash. Boom, right? So they fell all the way down to 400 per thousand or something, only to return back up into the up over a thousand again, a thousand per thousand. And then again, what happens, right? Because the mills went into curtailment, they went into overproduction, and then now, here they come back down again, the futures price, and the mills are back under curtailment again. So I was just reporting on it, I believe in the last video, that uh, Tolco up in the British Columbia area has announced the closure of two mills 
and that's going to pull hundreds of millions of board feet of production off the market just out of these two mills you can imagine what the rest of the mills going throughout the nation and their curtailments and how much inventory that's going to pull off the market now my experience working in the lumber yard the retail side of things back prior to the pandemic we noticed the inventory were tightening up and then when the pandemic kicked in it really zapped the inventory out there to the point that i could not get lumber like it, I noticed it first in the pressure treated lumber. I went to go order 4x4 pressure treated posts, the very first thing that you would need in pretty much any exterior project, and I couldn't get my hands on 4x4 posts. And that's when I knew that the major problem was kicking in. I have not seen that experience this time around. As far as like over the last few months, there is an, a tightening of inventory, and although there was times it became difficult to source out particular units of lumber, especially on the wider stuff, like 2x12, 2x10. Talking with the buyer for the store that I work at, he's saying that that is still the case, that sometimes it's difficult finding some of those wider lengths, but that everything that he has ordered has been available for purchase. I can only imagine over time here, as time goes on, if the price of futures, which, you know, what are we at? Like 363 per thousand right now? stays low like it is we're going to find more stories like the tolco one that we read about pulling even more hundreds of billions maybe even billions of board feet of lumber off the market okay so this is the situation that we are now in right we have low inventory we have production being pu pulled off the market and we have a pent-up demand that is starting to build now you think about it the longer that the builders are holding back from starting new homes that's more pressure because they want to build. I mean, you think about it, a home builder is not making money unless he is building homes. So if you go and you look at some of like the uh, Federal Reserve charts of like new housing starts, uh, new housing permit issuance, and you look at some of these things and you're gonna find that the numbers of like new home starts and permit issuance, or although are down dramatically over the year, they're really not that far off from the 2019 level, right? So we're really kind of on pace to where we once were prior to the COVID and everything breaking down. Now, granted, that was years ago, so you know there's a lot that's happened inside of that. But as far as like the crashing of permit issuance or or new starts, that's not really a crashing taking place. It's really a major pullback from the peak, but again, it's a return back to around the 2019 level. Could this continue on its decline? Yes, like the permit issuance and the starts and everything continue to fall. Yes, very much so that could be the case. And there's really no signs that that's not gonna be the case. Like it seems to me that that's, that's the way it's gonna go is that there's gonna be less permit issuance and less new starts. That's all based off of the fact that the Federal Reserve is keeping the interest rates elevated, which is driving the buyers out of the market, right? Like if you're a new home buyer, you're not really interested in buying at these higher interest rates. However, we are finding a lot of articles that are now starting to come out saying we may be finding a bottom in the housing market where, new, where the buyers are starting to find their interest, right? Which is not something that a lot of people were thinking about. Now, anecdotally, I was talking with a real estate agent just recently and asking how the market feels out there. And she was saying that it has definitely picked up quite a bit since, you know, considering the last year. She said the last few months have definitely had a lot more buyers interested in the buy downs. 80% of the loans that she is like, she's not exactly sure because she's the real estate agent, not the lender. She said it would have been a better question for the lenders, but that um loan buy downs are like the biggest thing hitting real estate or the real estate market right now and she was saying something about like 80 percent of loans out there or what she's guessing is about 80 percent of them are buy downs meaning that the person who is taking out the loan has well it's not the person it's actually the builder or you know the selling party or whatever who is selling the house will actually buy down the loan, right? Take some of the profit that they're gonna get from this loan or from the sale of this house and buy down the loan, meaning that they are going to give up some of their cash to take the interest rate on the, on the loan that they are, that the buyer is getting for this, for the, for the house. Gosh, I'm stumbling here. 
And what they'll do is they'll buy down that loan, meaning that the interest rate that they have to pay for the first two, three years will be much lower than what is typically going out there for a 30 year mortgage. So it's a way that the buyer is incentivized to buy the house with a lesser payment on it for the first you know, two or three years of, of the purchasing of the home. And then at that point, the idea is that interest rates will have fallen and they can refinance back into it. Anyway, this seems to be the big thing going on inside of real estate right now. And I'm just kind of curious on how prevalent that is going throughout the market. Could that actually be the bottoming of the market? Like being able to provide a better interest rate in the price availability or the price, uh, what I mean, the payment price, I guess is what I should say for the buyer out there. Anyway, that's me rambling on for 10 minutes about the housing market. I'm sure I missed something. What are your questions out there? Let's talk about the housing market as much as we can. Oh yeah. And how does this relate to the rest of the market? That's what I was going to say. The bullwhip effect, right? Totally taking place within the lumber industry when you have an oversupply, undersupply, oversupply, right? This was the bullwhip effect and I was calling it out back when lumber was running up to its all-time highs. And I said that this same thing was going to find its way throughout the rest of the markets out there, you know, throughout the rest of the economy. And just recently we've seen it happen in the pork industry, right? So a lot of pork producers, pork processors are now sh closing down their facilities due to the oversupply of pork, the added cost of going into the pork production, and then the, you know, the consumer demand dropping off because nobody can afford to buy pork anymore. Anyway, so these pork producers are now suffering the, the consequences of overproduction of pork during the time when there were shortages out there. Everybody said that there was gonna be, you know, food costs were gonna go up and nobody could get their, you know, their hands on any of this stuff. They ran out there, bought it all up, that drove the inventory to depletion and pork prices went through the roof. When the pork prices go through the roof, the pork producers are saying, hey man, I wanna take advantage of that. And they start going into investing into the production of pork. And what ends up happening? You end up producing more pork than is needed out there or the demand can handle. Then the demand falls according to the supply and the suppliers out there have to go out of business. And this same thing is happening in trucking. It's gonna happen in all kinds of areas, right? I mean, I can't exactly call it out because I can't really see it that well if it's not inside of lumber because I'm not, I'm only in the lumber industry. I'm not in an egg producer or a hog, you know, hog farmer or something. But you can see these things happening here, right? And, you know, like trucking is a really good one. We called that one out a long time ago when there was a huge demand for truckers, right? I mean, you think about it, like all these ports down in California were screaming that they were overloaded and didn't have any trucks and it was a national emergency and they were gonna hire the National Guard. Remember that? They were gonna get the National Guard to start moving these containers around the country and stuff. Well, that was a time when the demand for trucker was really high, right? People were paying a high price for this. Well, investment into trucking just shot through the roof. And now all these truckers and their investment is going into a malinvestment, meaning that they have to go out of business because they can no longer afford to make their payments on their loans for building up their business. Uh, okay, let's find that super chat. There it is, Mr. Django Geek. Thank you very much for the five bucks. <coughs> Excuse me. I just used a buy down for a rental property. Did you know? See? Very prevalent out there. Thank you very much for that. Hey, all night, what's happening? Hey, uneducated economist. Big fan of your perspective of these things. I've been enjoying your videos lots lately. Thanks for making them. Well, thank you very much for being here. And thank you all for hitting that thumbs up button. If you hit the thumbs up button and the YouTube algorithm will grab this video and go spread it around for more people to join in. Uh, I would short Bud Light. Yeah. All right. The big companies know this is the bottom. They are waiting for stumpage to drop because it is tied to futures. That is exactly right. So the stumpage fees, those are according to the futures price. So when the futures price is really high, they increase the stumpage. The only problem with this is, is that they do this like every six months, if I remember right. Um, I'm not positive on that, but I think it's like every six months they adjust this. 
So they might have adjusted stumpage fees really high back when lumber was was quite elevated, you know, back at seventeen hundred per thousand. Well, then the price of futures fall out, but the stumpage stays up. So the input cost going into these mills stays incredibly high. And this is one of the reasons why the British Columbia area is so sensitive. They're high output, high cost producers. And when the stumpage fees are elevated due to the futures price, that can be very damaging for these mills. Excuse me. When the price of the futures, when the lumber falls again, that stumpage stays elevated and these mills just can't really take it. So yeah, that is that is very true. And um, you know, you think about it, if the if the companies are waiting for that stumpage fees to fall, right? Which when it does, then the output coming from the British Columbia area would probably start to pick up. During that time, I would only assume that the demand for lumber would be picking up too due to the fact that there was a low supply happening because the British Columbia area was curtailing so much development. I get all that right? Okay. So, if you go and you look at, like, Lamar or D.R. Horton, I'd like to thank the viewer who mentioned that the other day, saying that these two uh, national home builders, their stock price, like, is near their all-time highs. I don't know if they're necessarily at their all-time highs, but they're definitely elevated to a significant level. And that would lead me to believe that the investors out there are seeing those home builders as a prime possibility of, you know, having having a lot of business coming into the future that's the only thing i could think of right like i mean there's going to be a lot of demand for houses out there and the home builders are going to be the ones who benefit from that if lumber prices are really low at the time that that takes place and the house prices haven't come down that's going to be a great opportunity for home builders to build homes with less input costs due to the low lumber prices did i get all that right i think so uh... Hey, thank you very much, Van E, for the $2. Lumber prices once carbon credits are realized. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm still trying to figure that one out. I mean, I know there's a lot of, like, landowners that are getting paid to not cut down their trees. Like, that's pretty cool. Like, you can make money off your land and not even have to work it. You get paid to, to keep the trees, you know, on your property, locking up the carbon. I don't know. Anyway, uh, da -da. let's see here. We bought in December last year, Big Island put down 25,000 or 20, 25%, 20K, and bought down our rate. Very cool. Uh, what dictates the stumpage fees? What are stumpage fees? Okay, so the government up in Canada, um, in the British Columbia area, they, they, there's a tax on the trees and the tax is called the stumpage fee and the stumpage fee is basically what the loggers pay to cut down the tree and right? if i got it right and so this ends up equating to an input cost going to the mills so it's basically like a tax for cutting down the tree i mean i guess that's the simplest way to explain it uh uh let talk hardwood uh, paying off my house next month no more loans for this guy hey right on that is awesome yeah i would let's see i'd guess building a house would lock up carbon for a century it yeah, could the people of bc own the trees that's right yeah that's that's how it goes down because i don't know because of the the way the government is is operated up there and so i guess like yeah the trees and the land that they are on and the benefit for it is all part of the people and like here you know we have a lot of privately owned land so it's not like the same you know when you sell your trees here in the united states it's not well on a lot of property here anyway uh let's see i'm currently working on ways to bring carbon credit tax credits to the taxpayer billionaires are buying land for the carbon credits but shouldn't the government recognize the taxpayers first? I don't know. Uh, stumpage is the payment to the people of BC. There it is. Okay. The carbon credits are junk. I looked into it for my land, and you have to agree to not harvest trees for decades. Not worth it. Yeah, that would be a little. I would be a little nervous of of doing something like that. You know, you find out like in five years that you could be selling your trees for a gold mine, or for you know 
for an insane amount, but you can't do it because you done promised that you weren't going to do it for 10 years, you know, that would be a bummer. Let's see, was there any more questions up there that I saw that I missed? Uh, okay. Okay, down to the bottom. Let's see here. Uh, seeing 0% down on new homes again. Really? Are they doing that? That's not a surprise, but I would imagine that that's not going to last very long. I, as the banking crisis continues, you know, it's a, it's going to be a continued banking collapse. Um, we're going to find more corporations and more bank failures going into the future. And I, I mean, I couldn't tell you like how bad it's going to get, you know, because nobody can really predict the future, but the pain is going to persist for at least another year. I mean, I could only assume another year. And that's due to the fact that the Federal Reserve has kept the interest rates elevated on the Fed funds rate, and you have a lag from the time that the Fed adjusts those Fed funds rates to the time it starts to impact the economy. So even if the Fed was to drop interest rates today, like drop them to zero today, we have at least six months of pain coming. And I don't see where the Fed is planning on dropping interest rates anytime for the next, you know, six months, maybe even a year, they may keep the interest rates elevated. And again, that's just a guess on it. So with that being said, I can't see there not being a painful economy for the people, anybody who is reliant on loans or interest rates, I cannot see it not being painful for the next year. And that's including the asset prices of things like homes. Yeah. All right. Best, best way to utilize carbon is turning it into biochar and also utilizing the heat from the process. All right, uh, if it's worth the billionaires, it should be worth it for the taxpayers. I think the answer is bundling all the states and federal land into an account of large value. We have oil fines in Alaska. Devil is in the details always. All right. Hi, I recently watched your video on owning beater vehicles. Yeah, very inspiring. I often feel bad because my buddies drive expensive vehicles while I drive two beaters as a daily off topic. <laughs> or oh, as a daily off topic, sorry. Hey, no worries about that, Liam Will. Um yeah, I, what do you feel bad about? Like your buddies have to make those high payments and, you know, be worried about their cars being dented in the parking lot and stressed out whether or not they are, you know, going to be able to afford the gas to get down the road. I mean, is that what you feel sorry for them? I mean, is that what you feel bad about? Because that's what I feel bad about when I see people driving new vehicles. You know, I love my old, my old cars, man. I mean... You know, somebody gave me a hard time the other day. They were like, hey, you could drive around and, you know, talk about owning beater vehicles. And then I see you driving a newer car. I'm not driving a newer car. That was my wife's car. And it's quite old. And she got a really good deal on it. And still saying that, I personally drive beater vehicles. Now, my wife is, you know, she has a job and she's making the payments on it. So that's like her car. Me personally, I don't want to make payments on a vehicle. I mean, I want the new Camaro. I want that new truck. I mean, I want to drive around looking cool, but I don't know who I'd really look cool for. I mean, I have a bunch of people here on YouTube who think I'm cool enough. I mean, you know, I, this vehicle does it for me. It gets me from point A to point B. Uh, my monthly cost going into it, I can't imagine being much more than 150 maybe $200. That's with insurance. You know, I mean, that's the life right there. Who wants to drive a new vehicle around? Ugh. All right. Uh, carbon. You guys want to talk about carbon credit stuff? All right. Roman Empire had a crash in the value of lumber in 359, close to the time of the end of the Western Empire. They did? <laughs> That'd be interesting. I'd like to see that one. All right. Good evening, UE. Good evening, Dwight. Right. I bought a bandsaw mill because of the lumber being so volatile, and trees are free on my property to use as a side hustle. The mill is paid for in cash. Right 1929 deja vu all over again. We aren't in Rome. This is in 359. History shows that cycles occur every 7 to 10 years. We are in a downward cycle. Hike 
in May and stay that way. <laughs> Gammon name dropped you today, EE. -E. Yeah, right on George Gammon. Yeah, he's my man. <laughs> I will. George is so cool, man. He he is the coolest. I called. I mean, I emailed him up. I was just like, hey, George, man. I was thinking about heading down to Orlando and hanging out with you. And he was like, yes, absolutely. Get down here, you know. So. Anyway, so I'm planning on going to the Rebel Capitalist here in a couple of weeks and go hang out with George and everybody else. I mean, gosh, I was looking at the list of speakers again. It's like all, everybody, all the cool people, you know, everybody's going to be down there. Peter Schiff and Brett Johnson and Jeff Snyder and Lynette Zhang. And geez, I mean, I couldn't remember everybody, all the cool people. So anyway, I'm going to go down there and hang out with George down at the Rebel Capitalist. So really exciting i can't wait to do that uh, rates are low no need for the fed to cut and the federal reserve sadly ron paul did not become president of the united states yeah i agree fed going to 10 percent for sure better not drop the rates fed funds rate predicting another 25 basis point hike then rate cut at september meeting rate cut november december Great's job from peak by year end. I doubt it. I doubt it. I think that's what the bond market and what everybody is predicting because everybody anticipates that the Federal Reserve is going for a 2% at a 2% target as opposed to a 2% average inflation rate over time. So because everybody is thinking a 2% target, it puts those forward predictions in improperly placed like i don't think that's going to be what happens i think the fed is going to keep interest rates elevated for a significant amount of time much further than what people are anticipating and in fact i think they've even mentioned that in their speeches that it's going to be elevated for much farther than what people are anticipating so i don't know we'll find out yeah thank you market mania that was a good comment too uh, Bud Light, is that a real beer? Why should they have a real woman? Okay. Uh, drop the rates in Weimar will look like patty cakes. Okay. Higher carbon tax for the rich. Uh, Daniel Floor, driving full-size semis from shipper to receiver the whole way is years away given the amount of computer system crashes. Well, that's exactly, they tell me what the payment and how cool they look. I own a Chevy Silverado with 340,000 strong engine and a Hyundai hatch. Maintenance every couple of years. I agree. I hate payments. Yeah. You know, I mean, I like the cars. I mean, they look cool, man. I mean, I see these trucks. I'm like, man, that thing is awesome. You know, I just like, I just don't see, like, I think about the payments, the money, and everything else, and I'm like, man, I, I don't know. Like, all the other things that I would rather be doing than to be looking cool while driving, you know? It's just, you know, I don't know. I just don't get it. Yeah. All right. Honda good for 400000 Get a Tundra. People want, want but no need. Yeah. When new vehicles in four years, you owe more on it than it's worth. In 10 years, you have nothing. Yeah. You know, when somebody else said something about like the reliability of a vehicle or something like that, and that's true. Like, I could totally understand, like, if you cannot. I mean, you cannot deal with a broken down vehicle, right? That's that's one thing, like, I totally get it. Like, you want something that is maintenance free, something that is reliable like that. I get it. Like I have two vehicles, right? So that if this one breaks down, I have a backup. And I understand that having a POS beater vehicle that you probably should have two because you never know when they are going to break down. As far as like the maintenance on them, that's not as like people say, oh, you're going to pay just as much in maintenance as you do on a on a car payment. No, you don't. That's ridiculous. I mean, that is absolutely ridiculous. I paid five hundred dollars for this vehicle. I've put tires on it, and I've done oil changes. That's it. Like and oh, and windshield wipers. That's what I've done. Right. That's the entire maintenance to this vehicle over the years that I've had it. Right. S ten. Same thing. Paid twelve hundred dollars for it. I put some tires on it, and I replaced the alternator. That's it. That's that's and that's I've had that one for a little over a year. So. It, no, there's not like 
it's not that expensive to maintain your vehicles. I mean, it's main, it's expensive to repair a vehicle if something bad goes wrong with it, but as far as maintaining a vehicle, that's not that expensive. And if you have a decent one, maintaining it's pretty easy. All right, yeah, but doing videos in a GTR would be cool. Yeah, it would. Yeah, it would be way cool, you know? And it would have been way cool to do videos from that office down there on Pier 39 with the Columbia River right outside my window. And when I made that suggestion for everybody that I should be doing my videos from this beautiful office right here on this pier that's looking out over the Columbia River, everybody told me that if you leave the car, we're leaving. We're out of here, right? So you got to stay in the car if you want us to be here. That's what my viewers told me. I took it to heart. I'm saying, okay, so I'll stay in the car. And this is where I am. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and sorry, just joined. Can anyone fill me in? Well, we were talking about lumber and the shortages and supply shortages and demand and whether or not that's coming from housing or if it comes from the people, you know, just wanting to go out there and build decks and fences. Who knows where the demand comes from? Let me see. What else did we cover? Um, stumpage fees in Canada are high. Those should drop. When it does, mills should fire back up again. Okay, I think that was all in a nutshell. <laughs> Sorry. All right. Uh, I brought back some slabs of one inch and two inch walnut and cedar from Arkansas. There you go. That must have been fun. All right. We need 25,000 debt jubilee per American adult. Ooh, 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 ooh. Okay, how does that look? How do you get a debt jubilee? Like, how do you make debt just disappear like that? I mean, I, I mean, I like the idea of it, but what you'll end up doing is creating an issue that is far worse than the benefit that you think you might get from it. So I, that's, that's a question that I would really have to ask. Now, you think about it, like, let's think about, like, what happened during the COVID lockdowns and the stimulus packages, because that was kind of like a debt jubilee of sorts. I mean, you were given a bunch of money to do whatever you wanted with. You could have paid your debt off with it. You chose not to, or, I mean, some people probably did. And I'm not saying you specifically, the person who made the comment. Um, Jesus. <laughs> Jesus. I'm going to call you Jesus. So, it's not like, you know, you might have not paid off the debt, but most people didn't go off and relieve their debt burden with it. They went off and stimulated the economy. They went out there and had fun with this money. So what was the results of this stimulus package that came out, right? Because this is really, again, this is sort of like a debt jubilee, but it wasn't really because you didn't pay off your debt. You went out there and spent the money. So even if you were to pay off your debt, you probably would just go off and spend the money anyway on new debt. So debt jubilee, what would end up being from that, right? It would be similar to like the stimulus package. The government would have to either print up a bunch of money and hand it over to you, which means that you get the money, but the debt goes on to the taxpayer's burden, right? So it doesn't necessarily just go away. It's just you get it for a moment. Now, if everybody gets this, and I mean everybody, what you're going to have is $25,000 of per person of additional debt burden going on to the government, which means that we're all going to have to pay for it later. And $25,000 per person is going to immediately start entering into the economy at once in all channels and a lot of it. So you thought you had inflation before. You're going to see the hyperinflation scenario come from it as everything out there would immediately get pulled off the shelf. And if you have $25,000, I mean, really, are you going to show up for work? I mean, are you? Are you? No way, right? Nobody's going to be showing up. Well, I mean, some people might, but most people aren't going to be showing up for work, which means that the distribution network would immediately collapse again, right? Which would cause the prices to go up even more. So this relief of pressure from the $25,000 that you think we're all going to get is actually going to be even more of a burden on you by the time it's all said and done. Uh, don't wish for that. Actually, what should happen is the government should increase taxes, right? And I'm not saying that this should happen. I mean, I'm just saying this is what's going to fix it. There's no fixing it. This is going to be what the problem is trying to fix. The problem is, is that the government would need to increase taxes, lower the benefits, right? So there would be more taxes, less benefits coming from the government. Um, 
people would then have to tighten up on everything that they had ever spent. Don't buy anything at all, like only the absolute bare necessities that you could possibly need. Every dime that you earn, you save or pay off debt with, and we do that for years to come, right? That's that's really how we fix this thing, right? It ain't gonna happen, right? That There's no way in a million years that any of that stuff is gonna happen. All right. Um, love Peter and Lynette. Yeah, I do too. I can't wait to meet Peter uh, in person, you know, because we did have that hour long conversation here on the channel. We did an interview with Peter. So I'm looking forward to actually shaking his hand and getting to getting to talk to him personally. Lynette, Lynette Zhang is so cool. Now I've met her quite a few times and I tell you, Lynette, she treats me like family. Like it is so fun to hang around her because she she does she like she comes up she gives me a hug hi simon how you been how are things going how's the, you know wife and kids how are you you know how's business going all the stuff like she is so cool about it she's a very personal lady all right um greetings from detroit well greetings my stuff is paid off debt free in less than a year yeah Orlando blows tolls everywhere Jacksonville best city in Florida yeah I didn't I didn't pick the city I'm just going to the event <laughs> uh, all big cities are left cesspools I prefer the country uh, May 10th people put it on your calendars 25 basis points next week and the Fed should cut 2024 I expect 10% Fed rate by 2024 at 10% Fed funds rate? I don't think so. I mean, I'm not saying that it ain't going to happen. I'm just, I don't think so. I don't think it's going to go that high. In fact, well, I don't know. I didn't think it was going to get to the 5%. So here we are. You know, what do I know? Okay. I agree. The Fed futures has been wrong on many of the hikes. I, yeah. And it's, it's because like people have mis misunderstood like if we had followed the Fed up until a few years ago, according to their past behaviors, and I mean basically up until quantitative easing, once they started doing quantitative easing, it really kind of shifted their monetary policies in the way they conduct themselves. But the Federal Reserve prior to quantitative easing, one, two, three, and four, they were very quiet. Like when they spoke, it was Alan Greenspan spoke, it was very hard to understand what it is that he was trying to say and when they did speak it was very infrequent like now the fed is constantly out there babbling stuff you got the fed presidents out there doing interviews all the time and stuff and they're always out there like doing the forward guidance and you know the credible threats and stuff like that but prior to that prior to the quantitative easing the fed hardly hardly gave any kind of forward guidance or any idea of what it is that they were going to be doing and with that, you could kind of predict what the Fed was up to because they were going for that 2% target or that 2% inflation target. And so, like, if they were over 2%, you knew that the Fed was going to adjust, in, in, you know, the interest rates up. If they were under the 2%, they were going to adjust them down. And it was pretty easy for the markets to predict this, you know, coming from the Federal Reserve. But then after quantitative easing, the lower bound got, you know, the Fed Reserve, the Federal Reserve dropped the Fed funds rate down to zero. Right. Which meant that they hit the lower bound. Dropping interest rates was no longer going to be an effective tool. And then they fired up the quantitative easing. And now this quantitative easing, it was really like the biggest credible threat in history out there because everybody, I mean, everybody, like including myself, everybody was screaming hyperinflation from the from the money printing. Right. They were talking about monetizing the Fed, monetizing the government debt and how this was just going to blow the inflation out of the water and that everybody needs to be in gold and silver. And by 2011, man, that was the case. Everybody was trying to run into it, but then they figured it out, right? That it wasn't creating the inflation that everybody said it was. And in fact, the Federal Reserve failed to achieve their 2% target many times during that quantitative easing, right? During the whole 10 year decade from like, what was it? 2008 or so when they fired it up to you know for the next almost what six seven years after that they failed to achieve that that two percent target so the fed didn't make it like the quantitative easing didn't do it for them right but it was the idea going forward 
that the that the Federal Reserve and all the money printing was going to create an inflation scenario and it was the inflation expectation that the Federal Reserve was truly looking for and they failed to get it in fact we talk about it many times in the um, in that speech that John Williams speech monetary policy for a low neutral interest rate world which he gave in November of 2018 and in that speech he had said that if the Fed's major problem was was a inflation expectation that was persistently too low rather than too high right so now here we are with an inflation expectation that is incredibly high it's exactly what the federal reserve was hoping for now they can move their fed funds rate up to the five percent which again i didn't think that they were going to achieve but that the fed would truly want to have because dropping of interest rates of five percent is typically how they would stimulate the economy so ultimately they got their ammo back like this COVID thing was the best thing that could ever have happened to our central bank not not, not my personally saying that but for the central bank's point of view because now they have their interest rates back they can stimulate the economy without having to go into like the quantitative easings and government stimulus packages and stuff like that i mean those things will happen i mean i'm sure of it but with the five percent fed funds rate that's what they would normally have for ammunition to stimulate the economy. And it looks like they're here, you know, it looks like they got it. Uh, uh, 400 parts per million PPM these days in the air, CO2. Okay, you guys are still talking about carbon stuff, huh? I don't know much about that. Like, I, you know, to me, that seems like a big damn scam. So I just, like, I don't know. I don't see how that... Like, I'm trying to understand the economic impact from this, but to me, it's just more another tax going to the government. So, I mean, it's just, you know, anyway. Uh, I'm building a house and cash. Cool. Agreed. Rates are going to stay high longer than people realize. It They will. May 10 CPI going to start coming down harder in the next few months. And again, it, it very well could. But again, I think about the Fed's arbitrary decision on whether or not they have achieved their 2% average inflation rate over time. Right? I mean, because it would be nice if they said, hey, this is how we calculate it so that we could figure it out for ourselves saying, okay, well, here we can tell by, you know, the average inflation calculation that they only have, you know, but they don't give us that. So we just don't, I don't even know if we know. Used car prices are still insane. Dealer was asking 17 for a used car with 40,000 or 21 for a brand new with full warranty. Same model Hyundai. Wow. Went with the new. Yeah, you're going to have to at that point. So, so glad Ron Paul lived long enough to see so many of his warnings and predictions be proved true. Yeah, Ron Paul's pretty cool, you know. I mean, I didn't actually get to meet Ron Paul because um, he just had so many people. He was like security and all kinds of stuff. And it was just like, and there was a lot of people trying to meet him and shake his hand and stuff. I, I didn't want to, like, I mean, it was just like he was over there. But I got to speak on stage to the same audience as Ron Paul did, right? So I was on the same stage speaking to the same audience. To me, that's almost as good as meeting him. So I, I call it, I, I call that one just as good, yeah. Because I've always wanted to meet Ron Paul. Ever since, ever since he was blackballed out of the Republican Party when he ran for president, I mean, when they were blackballing him out of the debates and all that other stuff, I lost faith with the Republican Party after that. I was like, that's it, you guys are done. I'm never gonna trust, I'm never trust you guys again. And, um, yeah, and after that, I just basically started focusing in on the economy. He was definitely a, a very big inspiration into, uh, into the uneducated economist. All right. Everyone needs to stop drinking in Bev's beers to effectively boycott. I, okay. I mean, whatever. I mean, if that's, if that's your thing, like, I mean, I'm not into drinking beer, so I don't care. Um, but you know, as far as like, you know, I don't know. Like, I mean, to me, like, if you're going to, if you're going to go about that, I mean, there is so much that you have to cut out. Like I'm invested in Anheuser-Busch, right? I buy Altria. I bought, a, you know, Mo. It's Anheuser-Busch and Marlboro cigarettes. I'm not, I'm not a fan of Marlboro or Anheuser-Busch. I don't really care about either one of those particular brands. 
that's not for me to decide on whether or not it's a good brand or a bad brand. I'm going from the fact that I know a little bit about addiction, right? And if my money can be made in that particular stock, from my understanding of what addiction is, I can really care less what brand it is. I really don't. I mean, you know, it's like people saying like, oh, I would never invest in a defensive stock knowing that they're going to go over there and kill people with it. Why not? I mean, everybody else makes money off of you. Do you think those rich elitists who are making millions, hundreds of millions of dollars, billions of dollars, do you think they're like, you know, oh, well, that's really good of you to uh, have like a moral obligation to not invest in this because, you know, you're not going to make it rich because you don't. I mean, come on. Like, you know, I'm tired of that. Like, it's not, it's make your money where you can. Like make make as much money wherever you can, as much as you can of it, right? Yeah. That's the way I see it. I don't, you know, whatever. <laughs> you rock, man. Great financial help to get someone's head straight. Much love and support. Well, thank you, man. I mean, I'm just giving my opinions, you know. It's a lot of times people are like, man, how do I do what you did, you know? And I'm like, man, I don't know if you really want to do what I did, you know. I didn't do very well up until I was about 40 years old. And even at 40, I had no clue of what it was that I was going to be doing. The only thing I knew that I had to do was quit drinking, right? So once I quit drinking, then, you know, intuitively, you kind of start making better decisions for yourself. But, but yeah, like, you know, when it comes to, when it comes to understanding, making, like, putting, making the right decision, like, what, how did you put it? Head straight. All right. Uh, you know, great financial help to get someone's head straight. To get your head straight, like. You know, it's to become economically aware, right? Because the like the things that I do and the decisions that I'm making and the investments that I do is going to be so much different from what you need to do and what's you know and what that person over there is going to need to do. And so, understanding this stuff for yourself is the only way that you're truly going to really be making the best decisions on where it is that you need to invest or put your money on the purchases you make and stuff like that. It really comes down to being economically aware and that's studying a lot of this stuff it's understanding the bond market it's understanding the fed funds it's understanding like supply chains and all this stuff um you know it's a long it's a long time of really trying to wrap your heads around to or wrap your head around all the different parts and pieces of it all and to know that there is so much stuff out there that you just don't know right like every day i am trying to learn something new about anything that's out there um you know like you know even talking with that real estate agent like she had to go and i'm still like i'm asking her questions as she's walking out the door like i can't help myself but to to try and take in as much information as i can and then try to process you know what it is that i'm bringing you know that i'm taking in it feels kind of like you remember short circuit johnny five more input more input you just keep bringing it in just keep bringing in the input and pretty soon you just started like you know understanding things on a different level you start understanding things from from your point of view which is going to be different from somebody who's you know a stockbroker right i mean if you're 100 you got a 100 million dollar stockbroker right your point of view into everything out there is going to be so much different than say like my buddy who's running the food stand across the street or across the river the way they look at the economy is going to be in completely different, right? And so when you're following these different people like on YouTube or on the news, you really have to understand where it is that they are seeing this from. When they are putting out their perspective, are they looking at analytics from a month ago and talking about lumber futures prices and comparing it to what they are, you know, studying from the events that happened a month ago? Or are you following the uneducated economist who's talking about things in real time? And then if you are looking at this, is it for an investment, like you're looking to invest for the future, or are you looking to invest into building a deck, right? I mean, there's, the information can provide you with so much that you need or don't need, right? I mean, if you're an investor, you don't really care about whether or not now is a good time to build a deck, right? <laughs> you know, I mean, that's like, that's not even part of it. But yet you're both looking at the same information to make your decisions on what it is you need to do. That's the reason why everybody needs to be economically aware. Whew, okay, I think I got that out. Did I get a big old super chat there? Where's that at? 
Oh my gosh, look at all these comments. Okay. Yes, I did. Thank you very much, Trask, for the $49.99. That is very cool of you, man, for the super sticker. All right. Right now we are in deflation. Then they are going to print $20 trillion. Um... Yeah, I mean, I don't know how the next one's going to go down. We are definitely in a deflationary scenario. Whether or not we're going to see that end up in the prices like everybody wants to see it, because that's really where it impacts everybody is in the prices, the deflation is taking place. You have to think, like, what is deflation? What is inflation? Inflation is the expansion of money and credit. Deflation is the destruction of money and credit. So right now, the Federal Reserve is in a t quantitative tightening program, although you do see the balance sheet expand, and that's probably due to the, to the new programs that they are using in order to stimulate the banking system or keep the banking system afloat. However, the rolling off of the treasuries is going to continue, and in a year from now, we, I'm assuming, right, we will find the Federal Reserve's balance sheet less than it is today. When that happens, that is dollars coming back to the Federal Reserve and essentially being destroyed. Now, that's like really the smaller issue. The bigger issue, in my opinion, is the expansion of credit. Okay, This is people taking out loans. Think about it. There's less house loans being written. There's less car loans being written. There's less you know, business loans being written. All this is a contraction of credit, and that is a deflationary scenario. Okay. On top of that, you also have to think about the return on capital investment. Now, the return on capital investment, that's when you put your money out there and you get the return on it. You get your principal plus the interest rate off of it. That, that's the return on capital investment. Can that beat the inflation that is taking place right now? So let's think about this for just a second. The real interest rate or the real rate of return. If you are an investor who is looking to get a 2% return, but you are anticipating a 1% inflation. Your real rate of interest is 1%. If the inflation expectation falls 1%, your real rate of return goes up to 2. 2% real interest rates, okay? So now this is something that's very difficult for a lot of people to wrap their heads around because when you think about the return on capital investment, when interest rates are really low, the return on capital investment does not beat the inflation. Your purchasing power is less than the inflation that is out there. So the return on capital investment when interest rates are low is actually a deflationary environment. When the interest rates go up and you get a decent return on your capital investment, that is money that you can then go back and spend into the economy. I like to relate it back to using like interest rates back in the early 80s. If you had inherited a million dollars and you invested that million dollars with the U.S. government for like 10 year treasuries, you would get a return of like 15 percent, 10 to 15 percent. You have like 100, 150 thousand dollars a year return on your capital investment going to the U.S. treasuries. That's a lot of money to be spending back into the economy, houses, cars, vacation, all the stuff, right? But then when interest rates went down to like 2%, now your million dollar investment will only get you like $20,000, which isn't that great for a million dollar investment. Even $20,000 doesn't even give you really a decent living anywhere in this country. And then to think about like after you have lost it to the purchasing power of inflation, really you have gone negative on your purchasing power. So a low interest rate is the deflationary that is you know, the deflationary scenario. Dr. Lacey Hunt talks a lot about that. That's one of the reasons why we didn't see inflation during the quantitative easing programs one, two, three, and four. It's because the interest rates are so low and the return on capital investment was actually negative. Uh, did I get all that right? <laughs> okay. Thanks for what you do, Simon. Hey, thank you, Trask, for that $50, man. That is very cool of you. Since nice. Chask is local here, by the way, he's a local uh, local guy who's into the construction scene. All right. Free money isn't free. Er, did you buy that house? Did I buy that house? Okay, well, I'm buying that house. I had to put an insane amount of money down on it. Um, and right now, according to the Zillow estimate, it's about a hundred and twenty thousand dollars more than what I had paid for it and after the forty thousand dollars that I had 
put down on the damn thing, I'm like $160,000 equity, according to the Zillow estimate, which is quite surprising considering that everybody told me that at this time, from a year ago, they said in a year, I would be completely underwater and being foreclosed on. So quite opposite, quite opposite scenario. Um, and I was not expecting that, that increase at all. In fact, I was anticipating it being a down, you know, prices going down, but it didn't happen, not on that house. So. Give it time, still could happen. All right, how much does it cost an egg in the market? I don't know, I went and saw eggs over at the market the other day for like four dollars a dozen i don't know where everybody's freak, freaking out about i mean i'm getting farm fresh eggs for 350 a dozen everybody's flipping out about eggs i don't know i don't get it you know keep it real and building a deck for reals yeah uh he was looking for a house in 2021 Yes, michael he did buy the house lumber is up in san diego awesome thanks yep Hey, Simon, you need to apologize to all your subscribers. Bad advice on deflation. Okay. Let me think about that. No. Why? I don't see it, man. Do you not, do you not see that oil is 50% of its all-time highs? Lumber's at 20, like, I mean, I think it's lost 75% of its all-time high. Um, in fact, can you name any single commodity that it's at its all-time high? I'm just curious about that. I mean, all this stuff is going to have deflationary pressures as those input costs start to drive the competition, prices on competition down, right? Now, everybody wants to look at it and say, hey, man, you were wrong about the inflation scenario. I wasn't. I wasn't even wrong. I was completely right. I said, follow lumber and the whole story is going to happen in lumber, right? So we saw it happen in lumber. I was exactly right about it. Right here we are at under 400 per thousand on the lumber prices. You look at pork, right? Pork producers are are going bankrupt right now because there's an over oversupply of pork. I was at the store the other day. Pork is cheap as hell, right? So I mean, if you want to pick and choose what's inflated, that's fine. But all these prices are starting to come down, and what you're going to find is that the real shortages are going to kick in because people like these pork producers aren't going to be producing pork here in the future, and then you're going to find pork prices going through the roof. Right? This is the bullwhip effect. I've said it many times here. I mean, it's not easy to see. I get it, right? I mean, even in egg production, right? I said it in egg production months before we saw the eggs go up in price. I mean, when you have, when you have it taking place, right? When you see it happening, right? You got prices going through the roof, but the producers are not getting the price for it. Okay? That is due to shortages. It's not due to the producers driving up the prices, right? They're getting paid the same thing. The egg production, they were complaining about it. Hey, we're not getting our, we're not getting paid for it. Loggers were complaining about not getting money for the logs, right? Even though lumber prices went up. All these com people complain about certain areas and point their finger and say, hey, it's greedy bastards that are doing this. But then they don't think about how it really goes down right because it's not as simple as like well these people are making the money and they don't so there's the there's the there's the guilty assholes right there that's that's not the way it works right you you have to really understand that all supply chains are quite unique right and how they operate you know even with the loggers a lot of people say lumber prices went up but loggers weren't getting their money somebody's getting screwed it's the mills doing it no logs are an exported item right they they ship those things all over the world and this country produces a lot of forestry products that we don't mill up, right? We send raw logs out of this country. Now, if we're not milling them up for ourselves and there's a bunch of trade wars and China's giving us the finger on logs, guess what happens? We end up with a glut of logs. And that's the reason why the loggers weren't getting the price when the lumber prices were up, right? Nobody thinks about this. Nobody talks about that then. Even with the egg production, when we were talking about that, you know, I shared a video with an egg producer saying, hey, do not let them blame avian bird flu. What is the problem right now? And the reason why you're going to have an egg shortage is because we are not replacing our hens. That's what that egg farmer said. He says, we are not replacing our hens. We are not getting, we are not getting the price for the eggs that is allowing us to be profitable due to the input cost right? The cost of feed, the cost of electricity, the cost of everything that goes into raising these birds to get the eggs. 
was increasing, but they were not getting the price for their eggs because they're under contract. Right? They have to sell the eggs for a certain price. Now, if they can lower their input costs, that's their profit. If their input costs go up, unfortunate for them. Now, in the stores, they can adjust their prices. They adjust it to supply and demand. Right? If there's less supply out there, demand goes up, prices go up. Right? That's how that ends up working. When prices go up and all of a sudden the demand for eggs is up and the price is high and the stores are saying, hey, producers, we got a high price for eggs. We're willing to pay you more. Guess what? They're going to invest into a bunch of hens because now egg producers can make a profit off of the off the higher prices. Well, what happens when you invest into a bunch of hens or over invest into a bunch of hens because you can get a lot of money for these eggs now? overproduction of eggs right this is the bullwhip effect and it happens in all kinds of industries out there i mean what was i just reading on the other day i mean it was another one that i was just i forgot what it was now i can't remember offhand this i mean it's all kinds of industries and it's not going to happen like together right you're going to find like you know this happened months ago a year ago another one's going to happen in a couple of years you know and you're going to find that this is going to take a long time before it finally finds its equilibrium and everything starts to balance out and we find a, a steady supply again all right buy a home with loans not a gift all right, I'm here to tell the truth. Inflation is not going down for necessities. And that's the other thing I said, too. I said it wasn't going to be in food and fuel. I said those are going to be two that you're really going to have to, you know, kind of exclude out of the deflationary, inflationary scenario. I mean, I said that one many times as well, but we're finding it occurring in food. So, I mean, I'm almost thinking that you're going to find fuel and food come down, too, in the future. I mean, think about it. What is a barrel of oil? It's at $70 a barrel right now. Give us some time, man. You're going to find that competition is going to start bringing the cost of gas down. Ga cost of gas is down, right? I mean, it's like a, what, three fifty or 4 I mean, it was over $5 a gallon. So everything is cheaper than it, than it was, and it's getting cheaper. I'm finding more restaurants are, like, the existing restaurants are starting to find themselves in a very painful position as they have increased their prices on all their menu items. And now newer restaurants and newer food distributors are coming in competing with them and providing a better value for it is it happening all over the place no but it's occurring why because people are paying a high price for food and if you can compete then you're gonna start getting the business you know all right so no i'm not apologizing i still believe in the deflationary scenario and i still think it's coming and i think if you follow lumber you could see it quite well so i think you're wrong <laughs> personally all right. What causes inflation? Inflation is caused by the... Okay. What causes inflation? Inflation occurs when you have money injected at all channels at the same time. Okay. That's the reason why we didn't see inflation happen during quantitative easing one, two, three, and four is because mainly that ended up as a lot of... It, 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 most of that ended up as reserves on the big bank's balance sheet and unless that got lent into the system that money never really actually entered into the economy that's the reason why all the money printing that happened during quantitative easing one two three and four barely did the inflation that that everybody said it was going to now it did increase the inflation expectation like people did anticipate it which did cause some inflation to happen because inflation expectation is a self-fulfilling prophecy but it didn't it wasn't lasting right because it didn't actually inject money into the system through all channels at the same time that's the major difference that we had experienced this time around right is that the inflation that we had experienced was because everybody was handed a stimulus check and told go out there and spend this right now right right now go out there and spend this right and everybody here you go here's money for every single person nobody gets nobody gets missed right everybody gets some of it and then at the same time, they went to the supply chain, the distribution network, and they said, nobody go to work. That's it. Cut that thing off, right? So now everybody ran out there with their stimulus checks because they didn't have this money before, and it's all money entering channels all at once at the exact same time. So these people, they went out there and spent it like they normally would, right? Like if they had this money, they, they went out and bought the things that they normally would go out there and buy, and it pulled all this inventory off the market. 
zapping the availability out there. Then they went out there with a huge news campaign and said, inflation, 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 inflation. Everybody, guess what? There's inflation. You're going to die from inflation, inflation. And everybody's inflation expectation shot through the roof. Now what do we have? Inflation everywhere. Inflation expectation. Tell me, where did the inflation go for lumber then? Right? I mean, if there was no one, I mean, if we really truly had money printer go burr, how come there's no inflation in lumber, there's no inflation in pork, and silver is still 50% of its all-time high? Like, answer those questions. See, like, I can answer why we got inflation. I know why. It's because we got the stimulus package and that money entered all channels at the exact same time. Now that the stimulus is over, you don't have that money injection happening anymore. You're not going to see the inflation like we once did, except for the fact that you still have a broken supply chain and you have the Federal Reserve saying hey guess what we're gonna keep interest rates elevated for a significant amount of time hurting the demand that is for all the stuff that would normally be produced and the producers are looking at you going at the Fed going like you're gonna hurt the consumer our customer and you expect us to produce into that are you sure I mean even Chevy just said that they were like canceling off what the Chevy Bolt not that that was a good vehicle or anything but there's no demand, like the demand for these things are falling, right? And that's really where the case is today. And that's the reason why we have inflation this time around and not during the quantitative easings and why inflation is going to fail unless they start giving out more stimulus packages. If they gave out more stimulus packages and we could enter that money into all channels at the same time or continue to do it, then we would have more inflation, like more price inflation coming from that, right? But then again, it would have to also you know, keep the supply chain severed, right? Because once people realized that there was going to be a bunch of demand kicking in, then they would start producing, right? If they produced a bunch of it and it didn't have a continuous stimulus coming in, then all that production would be an oversupply and boom, we would have the prices crash again. I mean, it's it's not hard for me to see this stuff. Like, I mean, I, I don't know. Like, I know like right now that the Federal Reserve is going to have to figure out a way to get new money into the system, right? Now, a lot of people will look at the government going to do it. It's not. It's the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve is the one who's going to have to figure out a way to, to get new money to come into the system. And really, the only way to do it is for government spending, right? So the Federal Reserve needs the United States to go deeper and deeper and deeper into debt, right, in order to produce those U.S. Treasuries for the Federal Reserve to buy. Like, I know the Federal Reserve is supposed to be monetizing the debt. That's exactly what they are doing, right? By doing this, they are able to provide the world with the world reserve currency. No other nation is going to be able to do that, right? Come even remotely close to doing that. China, they're going to have to figure out a way to get the new money in once their manufacturing is no longer bringing that new money in. And that's starting to be the case now. We're finding that manufacturing in China is more expensive than in places like India and Vietnam and these other locations in Asia. And so what you're going to find is that the manufacturing base from China is going to start finding its way other, you know, in other locations outside of China. That's going to put the new money coming into China on the down. Right? And that's going to start depleting the new money coming in. China's going to have to figure out a way to get new money coming in. Now, if it's not from manufacturing goods, then it's going to have to be from what? Debt issuance? Right? That's how the United States did it. Maybe China can just go and blow people up, fight, fight them, you know, like just go and destroy their stuff and take it from them. Or, you know, like they've put a lot of people into an economic bind by lending them money in US dollars that are now due back to China, right? So when the dollar strengthens, these countries start going into, you know, into bankruptcy, into default, and then China ends up owning all their ports, all their mines, all their distribution, you know, that they have all their commodities going on in that nation. That could be a way that China gets the new money coming in. But now you think about all these things that are going to be happening as China is trying to figure out a way to keep new money coming into their system. If it's not due to the manufacturing of all the products that are selling around the world, how is the United States going to react to that? Because the United States needs new money coming in too, right? And they do it by debt issuance. So if China is going to start competing by getting new money in by debt issuance, how's that going to end up playing out? Right, because China is going to end up having to find a way to sell their debt to the rest of the world, and the rest of the world probably doesn't really want Chinese debt. Now, if China can, say, dominate on a global scale with military force, 
well, then people would just naturally start falling into the Chinese debt because, well, they're the winners, right? If that's what was the case to be. Now, again, like I'm not saying that's what's going to come down to it, but ultimately what I see is a major war between China and the United States for the issuance of new money, right, and how to get it. And what that's going to look like, I couldn't tell you, but I can't imagine it being very pretty. All right. Four ninety nine from Brandon Ayers, uh, Fortified General Contracting. Thank you so much, man, for the four ninety nine. I appreciate your insight. Keep growing the channel. Well, thank you very much, man. I will. I'll do my best here. Okay, Danny. If you e is making wrong assumptions, I will call him out on that and make sure that all the viewers realize. No hate from me. It's not personal. Okay, Danny. You know. And here's the other thing, Danny. I've said it many times to my viewers and to anybody else who listens that if you are following me, right, and the things that I have done, are you making decisions for yourself, right? I mean, this is really what you need to be doing. I'm putting out the information. This is my opinion. I give you my reasons, my logic, and all the sources that I get it from. If you believe me, cool. If not, that's great, man. But I had called it out a long time ago as the inflation was kicking in, as everybody was calling, you know, lumber prices go up because of the money printer and all that other stuff. I was one of the few people out there. And in fact, I probably was the only one out there saying, no, you're wrong. This isn't the money printer. And what are you going to use for an excuse when the lumber prices come back down to normal? Here we are. Danny, give me that one. How come lumber prices are down under 400 per thousand right now? Did all the inflation just disappear out of lumber? Like just uh, inflation scenario, lumber's, nah, well, we got to just exclude lumber from our, from our, from our decision making or any of our analytics that we did, even though we were using lumber as the forefront of our, you know, inflation scenario back, you know, a couple of years ago. So what happened? I mean, let's take the, maybe inflation, maybe we don't have inflation. Let's take all the years of, you know, inflation that we have experienced and take it out of lumber right now. Where would lumber be? What, uh, 50 bucks per thousand? 100 per thousand? I mean, how, how low would lumber be right now if there was no inflation for the last couple of years? Right? It would be free. In fact, it would be negative. You, know, you go down there, they would give you lumber for nothing. All right? That's where it would be. It doesn't make sense to me because lumber didn't experience an inflation due to the money printer. I know exactly what caused lumber to go up, and I know why lumber is cheap right now, and I was able to call it out accurately for the last three, four years. It's one of the reasons why I was able to even make it down to the rebel capitalists and speak on stage. I mean, I'm not trying to defend myself as far as the, you know, whether or not you guys believe me. I don't really care if you do. Like, I mean, it's not, it's not up to, for you to, like, for me to make sure that you guys believe me. I don't care, right? I give you my information. I give you my opinion. I give you my sources. What else do you need, right? I mean, that's it. You go make decisions for yourself. <laughs> All right. All right. What well, you well, you pick out eggs, cars, and houses? Are you serious, man? I mean, come on, dude. Give something that's not in the news. How about that, right? You know. <laughs> How about the fact that plywood. Uh, went from eighty dollars a sheet down to twenty twenty four, and now it's at twenty seven. Do you know why it's at twenty seven dollars a sheet as opposed to twenty four? I know, right? I know. I can tell by the OSB manufacturing that is being curtailed right now, and the fact that they're pulling again millions of board feet or square feet of OSB off the market, which is now putting pressure onto the plywood industry and causing the plywood prices to go up. It's not any more demand for it. I mean, there is demand for plywood, but it's demand for sheet goods. And the fact that they're not producing OSB is now elevating the price of plywood, right? I mean, it's, it's just, this stuff makes so much sense to me. It's easy, you know? All right. Just paid mine off. And okay. Gold, electricity, my insurance, and Wi-Fi. Yeah, pick and choose, man. Pick and choose. All right. You know what blue dice mean. All right, certain goods are affected differently. Let's see, guys. Want to get land and possibly build now that, that lumber has dropped. Yeah, Doritos are expensive. Quit buying Doritos. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, you know, here's the other thing. 
you know, people complain about a lot of stuff that's out there, right? You know, like, you're complaining about food. Like, there was a couple of, like, you know, food products mentioned in there, right? Complain about food. You complain about, you know, say, expensive cars or, you know, whatever it is you got going on out there. You know, something, I made a suggestion. A guy says, man, I'm, you know, I'm worried about eating. Go get a job at a restaurant. You ever thought about that? Get a job at a restaurant. I mean, washing dishes, I guarantee you, you mean, it's not the greatest job in the world, but you get to eat, right? I, I mean, I guarantee you, if you work at a restaurant, you're going to eat, right? If you are looking to build a house, get a job at a lumber yard, right? Go get a job at a local lumber yard, and you are going to be able to build a house cheaper than anybody else can. This is the way you hack through life, right? I mean, you need a car. Go work at a car dealership. I guarantee you're probably going to get the best deal on a car if you go to work at a car dealership. Right? This is the way you do it. Like people are complaining. You want to complain about food? Oh, I can't afford food. I can't afford to live. I can't go to work for a restaurant. Then you don't have to buy food no more. Right? You know, you just get to eat. You know. And I mean, granted, it's stealing from the restaurant, but there's always lots of food at the restaurant. You know. I mean, anyway, go work for a cater. You know, catering or something like that. All right, 2019 versus 2023, no inflation. You know, stick to your inflation scenario, man. I mean, in fact, get rid of all your dollars. Don't hold any cash, man. I guarantee you, Danny, don't hold on to any of that cash because you're going to lose it to, to your purchasing power if you hold on to that cash. And in a year from now, you will not have the deal of a fucking lifetime when it comes to investments. I guarantee you, you will not have that, right? So get rid of your cash now. Right? That's my advice to you, Danny. Not to everybody else, just Danny. All right? <laughs> Get rid of your cash and don't think about the buying opportunity that you're about ready to have because it doesn't exist. <laughs> all right. It all doesn't go down overnight. Don't you hate it when your headliner drops? No. I don't even notice it. All right, falling lumber prices is good for the fight against inflation. It's not all gloom and doom. No, it's not. And that's the thing. Like, lumber prices will eventually equate into input costs going into other items, you know? I mean, mainly a house. But, you know, there's so many other things that are still incredibly elevated when it comes to prices on, on, on things like siding, windows, doors, trim these things are are still quite elevated the, the but the difference that i'm finding now that is that the lead times on these are coming down dramatically and when the lead times come down it's only a matter of time before the competition starts kicking in trying to you know be the ones who get the sale so at first lead times you know ran out to a long ways then the price is shot up all right now the lead times are coming down and the availability is starting to come, you know, present itself. It's just a matter of time. Yeah. Okay, so what is this? Please, I'm not comparing. Okay, okay, this is what Danny says. He says, so please tell me what the deflationary compared from now to in 2019. No, dude, I am not going to talk about, I mean, I've already given you everything that you should know about why it is that we saw inflation to such an extent that we have seen. All right now, if you think that those stimulus packages are going to continue to persist into the future and that the supply chain will never ever be repaired, then I would totally agree with your inflationary scenario. I would be right on board with it. I'd be like, dude, we're gonna have inflation forever, but that's not the case, right? That is not the case that we have right now going on, and we are going to see things reverse at some point. So, I'm not going to compare 2019 and a bunch of crap that took place within the stimulus packages and the severing of the supply chain and all the other stuff that happened during that time and say, please help me understand. What you delete your comment? Oh man, never mind. I'm done. I'm done with that. Oh, you bailed. Oh, you must have just quit. Yeah. Oh well. See, see, now this is the thing. Like, why do you stick to your guns so bad, right? I mean, it was just like, I understand the inflation. I understand how painful it is. And I mean, every one of us experienced it. I get that, right? But now, is it going to persist into the future when the Federal Reserve is raising interest rates and everybody is concerned about a recession and losing their jobs and, you know, and the purchases that they're going to be making? I mean, does it really seem like this is going to persist? I don't think so. Can we eat gold or eggs? Yeah, I mean, that's a good one. <laughs> you 
and just bought a new Sorrento. Hey, higher, but dropping in the last couple of months, starting to deflate. Man, Danny had all these comments. They're all gone. Where are they? Oh, well. All right. TJF Denver, $4.99. Thank you so much. Fad1, thank you for the $1.99. You guys are so awesome. Thank you so much for the support. Let's get back down to the bottom down here and find these comments down here. Whoop, there's another one. All right, NR, thank you so much for the $5. Core inflation still in fives, given housing is on a lag. If the Fed cuts rates, housing goes higher again. How long you think they keep rates restrictive? I think they're going to keep rates restrictive for a significant amount of time until they're able to achieve their 2% average inflation rate over time. I don't know how long that's going to take. Ultimately, if you really want to see a sign of a Fed pivot, unemployment rising. Once unemployment begins to rise, then you can you will know that the Fed will be pivoting shortly after that. But they there is no way the Fed is going to even reverse stance or, or pivot on anything so long as we have low unemployment. Yeah, even with all the layoffs and all the banking disruption, you know the the banking crisis taking place corporate and sovereign debt defaults, everything that's going on around the world, none of that stuff is really going to make any bit of difference so long as you have unemployment remaining low. You know, And that's because the Federal Reserve is trying to get that inflation expectation up. They're trying to get the growth rate back up again. You know, A lot of these things that they were complaining about prior to 2019, back in 2018, a lot of it has disappeared. Like, not necessarily disappeared, but no longer a problem like it once was. One of them was the demographics issue. Like, you know, they talked about too many old people. Now the major problem is infertility, right? It's like, yeah, we have a lot of old people, but now we need young people to be born, right? And this is a case across like most of the Western nations out there. So the demographics problem from having too many old people, now they're trying to figure out the demographics problem from getting young people to start having kids again. They had a growth slowdown, right? Global growth around the world had slowed down dramatically. This was the other major issue and interest rates were too low, right? They said it then that the, what? how did he put it? It was the uh, spread between safe uh, safe assets like the U.S. Treasuries and corporate debt were too wide, right? And that they wanted to bring this this spread down. Well, you think about it. When they had gone into the COVID stimulus and they dropped interest rates down to zero, a ton of money, a ton of investments started pouring into corporate debt. Now, a lot of that had to do with the special purpose vehicles and the establishment of the credible threat that they were going to be buying corporate debt. But still, the interest rates or the return on on the U.S. Treasuries was so low that there was really no return on your capital for investing in U.S. Treasuries. So that sent the investors who were looking for fixed income out there farther on the risk scale, which meant that they were moving up into corporate debt. The more they moved into corporate debt, it drove the yields down and the prices up. And those yields kept getting closer and closer and closer to the U.S. Treasuries. And that's exactly what the, what the Federal Reserve was looking for. It was one of their complaints is that the spread was too wide. So now, we're sitting in a situation in which that the U.S. Treasury is arising and it's putting these U.S. corporations actually in a very bad spot because most of them are now going into a position in which that rolling over that old debt into new debt is going to be very difficult and very burdensome for them. They won't be able to afford the payments and that's the reason why you're seeing a lot of these corporations starting to, starting to fold and go into default. And we're probably going to see more of that going into the future. Now, the companies who are good, viable companies they had taken out a lot of this debt when interest rates were really low and they're sitting on the cash. So right now they're sitting on cash and then cruise through this recessionary period while those who are basically junk bonds or junk companies, you know, the ones who are selling high yielding debt, they can't afford it anymore and they're going to start going bankrupt. That's the malinvestment. So the Fed's looking for this. When they when they started raising interest rates, they knew that they were going to be hacking the heads off these zombie corporations and that those people were going to get laid off. I had a feeling that they were anticipating that those people were going to move out of those high higher paying jobs that they got from these corporate, you know, from these really these uh what am I trying? These zombie corporations, right? They knew once they left there that they were going to find jobs over in the uh, service industry. 
And that's why one of the reasons why I said this may be one of the first recessions that we experienced where we didn't have a huge rise in unemployment, like everybody losing their jobs. That's the worst thing about a recession is that, you know, there's massive layoffs, unemployment, and then we end up bailing out all the corporations so that people can keep their jobs. This is what, like, the taxpayers hate it and the people hate recessions for that reason. But I said it, you know, the Federal Reserve could have put us in a situation in which that we don't have unemployment rise dramatically, or at least the layoffs, you know, intensified to the point that it pisses the people off. And the corporations already got their bailout. So we very well could be sitting in that situation right now. My uncle owns a lumber yard up in Minnesota, just saying, right on. Okay, moving onward. Jeez, look at all these comments. My goodness. All right, if you had a lump sum to invest, what would you do at this point? You know, I get asked that a lot. Um, I mean, at this point, I don't see any other position that I would want to be in other than maybe some of the precious metals. Like, I would get into precious metals. I would get into mining it, mining shares, if that was, you know, something. Um, I probably would dollar cost average some of it into cryptocurrencies. But for the most part, I would just hold on to the cash for now. Because I think there's going to be a hell of a buying opportunity coming in the future. Um, so, yeah, that that would be me. I would hold on to, hold on to the cash. Or maybe get into some of the precious metals or metal miners or something like that. And that's just me personally, you know. I mean, there's other people who probably know a hell of a lot better idea on what to do with it. All right. Well, she was right. Lumber is up 5 or 10% now from what it was in 2019. No, it's not. At what point? I mean, from, lumber moved so much in 2019. I mean, are you talking about from the peak of 2019? Or are you talking about the average through 2019? Like, because, I mean, if you want to pick and choose your times, I mean, how about lumber's experience from a 1,700 per thousand peak to 400 per thousand it is today? I mean, I don't even know. How many thousands of a percentage deflationary drop is that, you know? (laughs) All right. We should go live with Danny, but only if Danny can keep his blood pressure down. I don't think Danny's part of my channel anymore. I think they quit. Yes, Danny was 100% correct. Everything he, she named was way up higher in price compared to 2019 before the stimulus. Okay. Okay. Hell of a buying opportunity, A. Yeah. Jobless, worst thing, lucky, only experienced once since 80s, most worked for myself. Mostly worked for myself. There's always buying opportunities. I preach very little and make predictions even less. I just learned you witnessed it. <laughs> this guy must be the lumber mafia. Well, I tell you, I'm not the lumber mafia, but I mean, if there's... I don't know where it is that there would be any more information about lumber that I haven't gotten. Like, I'm sure there's probably some details that, you know, people have experienced on their own. But as far as the general information of the lumber industry, I got it. Like, I know it better than just about anybody did out there. And it was pretty fun listening to some of the people tell me about how little I knew about monetary policy, how little I understood about inflation, how it very much like what Danny was saying to me. I mean, all these things, they're telling me how wrong I was. And yet nobody, still to this day, nobody can explain to me what happened with lumber and why inflation doesn't seem to be presenting itself in lumber at this time. Or at any time, as far as, far as I'm concerned. Like, never once did I ever see inflation hitting lumber. Right? So, I don't know. Like, I mean... Everybody else can, you know, come up with their own excuses or reasonings for it. But I think I was pretty accurate on lumber. I think I was still accurate today about it. I think that the ideas of the money printer causing lumber prices to go up were completely out of line. They were not even close to being accurate. So if I make these calls out here when it comes to deflationary scenario, I'm not going to sit here and defend eggs. 
I'm not going to sit here and defend, you know, all these little items, cars and houses and all these little items that are out there. I'm looking at monetary policy, right? I'm looking at the expansion of money and credit. That's the reason why we saw inflation, right? Was the expansion of money and credit. But you have to have that money entering all channels at once. That's the reason why we saw inflation during the stimulus packages, but didn't see it during quantitative easing one, two, three, and fours, because that money didn't enter all channels at the same time. I mean, how is this, am I not explaining it? Well, I mean, is it like, you know, is this too easy to just say money printer go per prices go up, right? It's the federal reserve and the money printer that's caused prices to go up. Super easy to understand. That's it, right? Forget about everything else. No need to understand a single thing about stimulus packages or, or you know, money injection or severing of the supply chain or production of new manufactured goods. None of that stuff you need to understand. You don't need to worry about any of that stuff. All you have to know is that the money printer went off and that's the reason why you had inflation. I mean, does that make sense to you? Is that, is, are you willing to accept that, you know, for your reasonings? I mean, I'm not, like I had to look way deeper into that. Yeah, you know, and when I saw it at seventeen hundred and everybody was screaming, and I'm like, that's it. I I know better than this. Yeah, you know? and I was right, right? I mean, you know, people can say, well, you're wrong about eggs. Okay, <laughs> whatever. Yeah. <You know? laughs> Why are studs ninety two and a quarter? Actually, they're ninety two and five eighths. Um, why are they 92 and 5 eighths? Well, you have pre-cut studs. You have 88 and 5 eighths, 92 and 5 eighths, 104 and 5 eighths. There's, what, 114 and 5 eighths? I don't know. There's all these different pre-cut studs. 92 and 5 eighths and 104 and 5 eighths are the two common pre-cut studs. And the reason why they do it at these particular lengths is that when you put your top plate, because you have your stud in the wall, then you got a top plate and you got a bottom plate. Right. Well, the top plate is actually a double top plate, right? So they put two of them up there to tie the walls together. Now you add all those numbers together and you come up with this a little bit over 98 inches, right? Or 96 inches. I'm sorry. That 96 inches happens to be the, just that little bit over happens to be a perfect height, right? To pop up a five eighths drywall on the ceiling and then put two sheets or, you know, an eight foot sheets of drywall up and have enough room on your studs to to do that entire wall. If you did it out of a straight eight foot, like a 96 inch stud, you would have a gap of four inches or so that you would have to fill in with a strip of drywall. So they pre-cut these studs so that they make it easier for later on in the construction process of it. And then the 104s are for nine foot ceilings. Does that make sense? Hey dude, I was all on with your channel in 2022 and 2021. It definitely helped. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you, you are the lumber guru. Yeah. I appreciate it, man. And you know, and it's like, you know how many people came to me and said, dude, Thank you so much. You have no idea how much money you saved me. I was going to do a deck package. In fact, Lumberjack Landlord talks about this, how he had planned on doing a deck package, but because of the videos that I was putting out, he decided that he was going to postpone those deck packages. And it turned out that, you know, by postponing and waiting the six months or whatever it was that he had done it, he was able to save thousands of dollars off of those projects. I had a gentleman come into the store. He did he just popped in. He he has business down in Cannon Beach, which is you know quite a you know quite a ways not a, quite a ways it's you know down the coast a little ways. But he stopped into the store just to shake my hand and to thank me. He said, "Hey, we had a roof project where we had this huge remodel, an entire new roof needed to be put on the house, and we got a bid for it. I told my mom to watch your channel." and to hold off, right? You know, to say, hey, watch this guy's channel. Look what he has to say about like lumber prices right now. I really think we should postpone redoing this roof right now and wait. They waited. They just got a new bid for it. The new bid is $13,000 less than what they had originally gotten. The guy just shook my hand. He, you cannot believe how thankful he was. He was being so sincere. And like I'm like, yeah, man, no problem. Thanks for watching the channel. He's like, no, you don't understand. Thank you so much. You saved us so much money. You know, and I'm like, hey, man, thanks for listening. You know, no problem. And that's really being economically aware, right? I mean, you may not have understood 
that the lumber prices were up. And now when we think about it from the inflation scenario, money printer, there's no way that the lumber prices are going to come back down. But yet you took a chance by listening to the uneducated economist and some of the things that he was saying and giving the evidence, like give it, you know, showing you down in the description of, of every one of my videos, the articles, the, the, you know, the links to where it is that I'm getting the information. And they said, man, this guy's making a lot of sense. Let's hold off on our project. And man look how it worked out for him right again you know you had to be economically aware for yourself right to be able to make these decisions but yet you look at the fed and you're thinking at the time man this doesn't make sense and this guy does right and then what do you get you get thirteen thousand dollar savings out of it yeah maybe danny should think about that right <laughs> good on you for ethereum but crypto needs recognition until then it's all skeptical in the u.s under the sec yeah I, I agree with that like i have no no hardcore beliefs that bitcoin is going to be a viable currency in the future but i am tired of missing out on it so i'm in i'm in on bitcoin you know and i believe it will be here um i believe that it will be used but i don't know it's, it's hard to say Inflation hit during COVID. Studs were eight bucks. What the WTF? That's inflation. No, it's not. No, it's not, Chuck. Right? No, it's not. What that was was a supply chain breakdown. It was a lack of availability. And that's the reason why those studs went up to eight bucks. You have some people who are inelastic, right? They're like, man, eight dollar stud. Hell no, I ain't touching that. Right? But then you have other people who are like, dude, I got a house to build over here. I have no other choice. I have to get going on it. Give me those $8 studs. You don't even have them? Who has $8 studs? You got $10 studs? I'll take those studs. Give them over to my job site right now. We got to get these pieces together. That's what drove the lumber prices to their all-time high. It wasn't the money printer. I mean, if you want it, if Chuck, if you want to believe it's the money printer that caused it and you have all the evidence in the world that, that gives you that reason to believe that, dude, go for it, man. Don't listen to me. I mean, what do I know, right? I'm the uneducated economist. I don't, I mean, I didn't go to school for any of this stuff. I'm just learning this stuff just off the internet like everybody else is. I'm using my real, like, real life analytics from what I am, like, seeing in front of me, you know, talking to mills, talking to contractors, talking to distribution networks, talking to my customers, you know, I mean, I work retail lumber for a living. There's really no position in which that I do not have my fingers on the pulse of that industry. Like I know every corner of it. And so if you want to say that the Federal Reserve is the reason that the, all the money printing has caused the lumber prices to go up, where is it today? I mean, it's not like they pulled all the money out of the circulation, right? I mean, all the money printing has still happened. They barely tightened up the money supply at all, but yet all the inflation has left lumber. It's gone. Does that make sense to you? I mean, does any of that make sense to you? No, of course not, right? But when you think about it from the supply chain, when you think about it from, you know, some of the descriptions that I have talked about with the inelastic demand and the, you know, in the inventory shutdowns and the mill, you know, curtailments and stuff like that, or the inventory depletions and the mill curtailments, all this stuff, you start putting the pieces together, it just makes so much sense. It made perfect sense. So much so that people were able to save thousands of dollars by following my information, right? because I was able to call it out so accurately. And I'm calling it out now. Like, I don't know how far out into the future it's gonna take before we see lumber prices go back up, but I can tell you now that the buyer sentiment is still low. The home builder sentiment is getting ever closer to that 50 mark on the index, which means as soon as it crosses over 50, it's gonna go positive. And when it goes positive, they are gonna be on it. They are going to be a huge demand for lumber. And I just don't see where there is a lot of production and inventory to handle a big supply or a big demand jump, right? I mean, these are the pieces that I put together, right? So now when prices go back up to, you know, to some highs, I don't know, 800 per thousand, 1,000 per thousand, I don't know where they're going to go. But when they do, everybody's going to be like, hey, dude, there's your money printer. There's the prices that you were wondering where inflation went. And right there, it's in lumber right now. You Don't you see it? And here it is. I'm calling it out. Right. But yet I know when the prices go back up that that's what I'm going to hear that people are like going to tell me again, you're wrong. It's back to the money printer that caused this. Right. It's not. I mean, I'm giving you the reasons right now.
right? That well, why the lumber prices are going to go up. But I know when it gets there that people are going to call me out and say that I'm wrong, you know, and that's okay. I mean, I'm cool with it. <laughs> All right. Moo Man, thank you very much for the $6. How do you deal with the fact that people are wrong when you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you were right? I don't, I, I, yeah. I mean, there's, there's things that I understand that I'm not going to be right on, right? I know that I'm not going to get everything right. I know that there's, you know, a lot of times that I, you know, I miss it. I miss the mark on a lot of things, right? I didn't think that the Federal Reserve was going to get the Fed funds rate up to 5%. I mean, if you asked me about it, I would have said they probably get it somewhere around 25 to 3%. And that's about as far as it's going to get before they really start impacting the economy. But when you think about it on that sense, too, am I really wrong yet? I mean, yeah, the Fed funds rate are up to 5%, but we have a lag. So if you go back six months ago, you're going to find that the Fed funds rate were right around that 25 to 3%. Like we are now moving in from a neutral to a restrictive economy. And that's really what's impacting the economy, not the Fed funds at their stated level, right? I mean, that impacts the markets right away. That They, they, they react right away to that. But the economy has a lag period to it. So really, even though the Fed has their interest rates or the Fed funds rate up to 5%, the Fed funds effective rate that's impacting the economy is six months ago. That's somewhere around 2.5-3%. So really, if you look at it that way, I'm not quite wrong yet. You know, I mean, <laughs> just kind of wrong. I'm wrong. I mean, I said that they weren't going to get it to 5%. They did. So, you know, I got that part wrong. Well, UE, can you please tell me what items, goods, you happy about right now, post-2020, in which you think prices are cheaper besides lumber? I don't know. What is it that... I mean, my wife works at a grocery, so our grocery bill is still quite low, but she looks for the good deals and she knows how to shop. So, like... I'm not complaining about food prices, but then again, I'm not in a situation in which everybody else is dealing with it. Um, I'm not buying new cars, so I don't have to worry about that one either. Gas is a little cheaper than it was earlier. I'm not knowing about 2020. I don't remember what it peaked out at or, you know, or actually dropped to the low of because in 2020, there was hardly anybody even driving at one point. So I don't know. None of those things. Let me think. What else do I buy? Nothing. I don't buy anything else because I'm frugal liver, right? I mean, I, I live like I only buy the things that are absolutely necessities to me. So I invest my money. Inflation doesn't impact me like everybody else. People who are like, I, I mean, I'm trying to even think of like what it is that I bought that I was complaining about the price of it being. Uh, charcoal briquettes. I don't know. Like, I bought some of that. Yeah, that seemed kind of expensive. I don't know. I bought a barbecue the other day. I got a really great deal on that. It was a $180 barbecue. I bought it for 40 bucks, but they were being discontinued, so I had great access to those. Uh, that's cheaper. <laughs> I don't know. All kinds of stuff. I mean, I found uh, some nails from India that were cheaper than the Chinese ones that I used to get. I don't know. I mean, if I can pick and choose a bunch of stuff if I really thought about it, you know. <laughs> Not looking for regular buying opportunities like in other recessions. In my opinion, the economy is changing rapidly and investing in new technologies like some AI projects and crypto is more profitable. I think it can be, yeah. Rest in peace, Danny. You will not be forgotten. No, you won't. In fact, we'll bring that name up a lot. All right. Why don't you bet Danny then, since you don't think money printer didn't cause the inflation? What caused the inflation was the money injection of all channels at the exact same time during a time in which that there was a severing of the supply chain. Period. Right? If you feel that it was the money printer that caused it, then why don't you explain to me first why we didn't see the inflation during quantitative easing 1, 2, 3, and 4 when the Fed took the balance sheet from $850 billion to $4.75 trillion, right? How come there was no inflation? Where did the inflation go? I mean, we saw it in some asset prices like houses, but we didn't see it in the everyday common goods that we were all buying. So why don't you explain that to me? Since money printer go 
off and prices go up, it didn't happen during quantitative easing one, two, three, and four, right? Now I know the reasons that it didn't happen, but you want me to explain it to you again? You know, I mean, I just explained it. So I'm not gonna like, what is it? Explain Danny then since you don't, what, bet him what? What do you want me to bet? What item? Well, we bet on lumber, all right? How about we bet on lumber and find out where lumber prices go? I'll bet on that, yeah. All right, I'm looking at a five-year chart of lumber commodities. Very dramatic price changes. Yes, it is. Housing is crazy busy. I hear rumors that the tree huggers are getting a firmware update. Trees are bad now. What does that do to supply? Are getting... Uh, change your name to all-nighter hider for when you disagree with someone. Wow, you did say it. I remember the time of 1700 Futures. You called it right. Thank you, Woody. Yeah, I did, right? And I appreciate that, you know, that you were there to see it. You know, I... I, I don't know where it is when I was doing those lumber videos that people got disconnected. Like, there's a lot of you who are like, you know, who, who stuck with it. You were like, bro, no, I, I see it, man. I see what you're saying. But a lot of people broke, broke from the channel, like saying, dude, you're wrong. You're absolutely wrong about all this stuff. You're, you're, you're missing it completely. Right. Even, I mean, even after I was invited to go down and speak on stage in, in Houston, you're like, people were still telling me that I was wrong about the lumber thing. You know? And so here it is. Like, I mean, I don't even know how many years later, four years later, and I'm still calling the lumber market and still people are telling me that, you know, I don't understand and I'm missing it, you know? Zero inflation. Now, I wouldn't say there's zero inflation out there. It's just that what causes the inflation is the real thing, right? You have to understand what it is. If you printed up all the money in the world and then it sat in a bank account, would that cause inflation? Like you printed up a hundred million dollars or whatever, a hundred, a yeah, hundred trillion dollars and it sits in a bank account. Like it never once ever gets loaned out or anything. Money printer go burr, prices didn't go up because the money sat in the bank, right? That was quantitative easing one, two, three, and four. But this time around, there was stimulus checks handed out and they severed the supply chain. Those two things is the reason why inflation went up right? It's not going to continue because one, we don't have a severed supply chain anymore. And two, we don't have stimulus packages being handed out. So once the supply catches up with the demand, we are going to find the prices come back down. This is the real, I mean, I've explained this so many times, right? Back months ago, nine months ago, the Federal Reserve, when they said that they were hoping to get help from the supply side, I said it then. I said, you're not going to get help from the supply side. In fact, it's going to cause inflation to move out even further and longer because of the actions from the Federal Reserve and what they were anticipating. So they had demand had gone way up, right? You sever the supply chain, you give a bunch of people stimulus packages, demand goes way up, supply dropped way down, right? And now what they're saying, hey, we are going to hurt the demand. We are going to hurt the consumer by raising these interests, by lifting these interest rates up as high as we are, raising them up, the demand for consumer goods is going to come down. So the demand is going to come down. At the same time, the same way, we're going to hope to get help from the supply side, which means that manufacturing and distribution is going to ramp up. People are going to try and, and participate into the economy with their supply and manufacturing. But yet they hear from the Federal Reserve that the consumer is going to get hurt. So he had supply down and the consumer is getting hurt. So now the supply is falling and the consumer is falling as well with it. Until this finds a bottom some point in the future, and that point, you'll start seeing supply pick up. These two balance out, and you'll see the prices stop, to fall, stop falling. And when supply picks up, competition will start creating the lower prices. Right? This is how I see it going down. I, I mean, that doesn't seem too far out of logical, right? I mean, does it, or does that just seem completely, like, crazy, right? <laughs> Thank you so much, NR, for the $5. UE, keep it up. You offer a unique perspective on the Fed, well-informed and outside traditional finance circles. Rare. Appreciate your views. Yes, thank you very much, NR. And the reason for that is, is that almost everybody, almost everybody who has any kind of understanding of the Federal Reserve learned it in a classroom from a professor. 
right? This is how you understand the economy. And they hand them it over and they say, here's your system. You understand it like this. And if you deviate from this, you're wrong. I never got that lesson. I never learned it that way. Like I have no clue of how it is that other people look at the Federal Reserve because I'm looking at the Federal Reserve from the way that I learned about it. And that was from my own research, from reading Federal Reserve speeches, from trying to figure out you know, what monetary policy is. I mean, there was a time when I didn't know what monetary policy and fiscal policy were. Like, I had no clue of what that meant, you know? I thought monetary policy was something that the government did. And then I realized that fiscal policy is what the government did. And that just blew my mind. I'm like, whoa, whoa, that's the way. And like, so many people don't even understand this, like the difference between monetary policy and fiscal policy. When the Federal Reserve said it, they said, hey, we got interest rates near zero. It's really not going to be a whole lot of stimulus coming from the from the from the injection of money from the quantitative easing programs. This is going to take a lot more fiscal stimulus. That means government spending. And I'm thinking, what the hell is the government going to spend on that they can stimulate the, the whole damn economy with? And then COVID hit. And I'm like, oh, oh. Yeah, plenty of places to stimulate the economy now, you know, and just about every corner of the market you could stimulate. And it was pretty easy to see that. I mean, you know, you think about it, like how many people explain the bailout of the corporations the way I do, right? I mean, when I talk about like how those special purpose vehicles were set up to bail out the corporations, a lot of people look back on that. They go like, holy moly, whoa, dude, that makes a lot of sense. Like, you know... It, it, in fact, here, let's just talk about it real quick. During the COVID lockdowns, right, they had these special purpose vehicles that were set up, 13 lending facilities. This channel, The Uneducated Economist, covered every single one of those with a different video. We covered each one of the lending facilities. Now, one of those lending facilities was caused, was caused the corporate debt lending facility. Now, in conjunction with the Treasury, the Federal Reserve set this thing up, which is an entity. It's separated from the, from the Federal Reserve and the Treasury, the special purpose vehicle. Now, the only reason why they were able to set this thing up is because of the, of the unusual and exigent circumstances of the COVID pandemic, right? Without the pandemic taking place, this special purpose vehicle would never have been allowed to be used, right? It would basically be illegal. But the unusual and exigent circumstances give the Federal Reserve and the Treasury the ability to set it up. They fund it with hundreds of billions of dollars and then put out the narrative, hey, we are going to be buying the falling angels, right? The fallen angels, all these corporations that were viable companies that were getting hit hard because of this COVID recession. They were going to make sure that these guys didn't fall, right? And that they would be buying up other corporate debt as well. Now, all these YouTubers, all these news agencies, all these people went out there and were screaming their heads off that the Federal Reserve was going to be picking the winners and losers and that they were bailing out these corporations by buying corporate debt. Yes, they bought a little bit of corporate debt. Right? They established that credible threat that news and YouTubers and everybody else out there screaming about how the Federal Reserve was going to be doing this caused a lot of the market, the investors, to go out there and start front-running the Federal Reserve. They started buying into this corporate debt before the Fed had a chance to do it, thinking that they were going to be selling this debt to the Federal Reserve as the Federal Reserve was buying hundreds of billions of dollars of corporate debt. The market started running into this stuff. The Federal Reserve sat back and watched them do it. It drove the yields down and the prices up, and all these corporations got bailed out by the market just simply by establishing the credible threat of using these special purpose vehicles. Very rarely will you find an economist talking about that, right? I'm one of the few people who keeps bringing that up over and over again, because if we don't bring it up and keep talking about it, it will be forgotten about, right? But that's what happened. That's why a lot of these corporations right now are sitting on a ton of cash and they don't need to be bailed out during the next recession. You can go ahead and let the layoffs, let the bankruptcies happen. Let these people go and suffer through a bunch of pain because the viable corporations, the fallen angels are bailed out already. You already did it and the market did it, right? They didn't even, they, the government and Fed doesn't even have to do nothing, right? They just sat back and they're like, all right, the market did, took care of business for us. So yeah, find another economist out there who talks like that. All right, thank you very much, Van E, for the $2. Danny, we want clear critique. What's the thesis? All right, let's be a gold coin. Let's bet a gold coin, Yui. On what? What are you talking about? 
on whether or not the Federal Reserve is going to be doing quantitative tightening. Like, I'm already won. I already won it. I already won the deflationary thing. Like, it's already happening right now. Are you waiting for evidence of it? I mean, no, I'm not going to bet you. I already won. Huh. All right. The Home Depot got a hell of electric bill each store. That's that. All right. Buckle up, Tim. Okay, I have two safes full of guns and cash, silver, gold. I have food stockpiled for three years, and my wife and I own our own business, and I'm still afraid it isn't enough. Okay, uh, Sooner Bear, dude, dude, you have, you're good, man. You're good. You know why you're good? It's because you have the right mindset for it. Okay. If you are living in fear at this point, you are not in the right mindset. You have got your, you got your preparation done, right? You have got three years taken care of. You got your safety, you got your security, you got your, you know, you got everything going in the right spot. But here's the problem. If you're living in fear, that's, that's the last thing you need to figure out, right? Because living in fear is a negative and it's a negative energy that you are going to draw towards yourself. Right? So even though everything else in your life is perfect, you're going to feel this pressure coming down on you because of that negative, because of that fear. So we, you got to figure out, you know, I don't know how you're going to do it, but you got to figure out a way to, to, to get out of the fear, to not be afraid. Because that, 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 fray, that, that is going to be the negative energy that is going to keep you held down. Right? You know, it's just like anything else out there. If you have a negative energy, it's, it's going to bring negative things towards you. All right, Yui going to invite me to his live channel and bet me or what? <laughs> On what, bro? Like, what are we, what is it that you're even wanting to bet against, man? I don't even understand this. People are saying, dude, you need to bet him. Bet him what, you? Like, what's the bet? Let's bet inflation isn't going back down to 2%. How many gold coins? Okay, over what's your time period, bro? What if it takes 10 years? Are you going to, I mean... What's your time period? I don't I have a time period on this. So you're saying it's not going to go down to 2%. I'm saying, like, yes, it is. I just don't know when. Like, I couldn't tell you how far out, right? You know, so, like, I mean, what if it takes our entire lives? I mean, I'm not saying that's going to be the case, but you got to give a timeline to it. I'm not going to do it in the next six months. I'm not going to say a year. I'm not going to even say five years. I'm not going to do that because I don't know, right? All, I mean, it's just a matter of time. All nighter, no, I can't until you e bets me. What did he have to say? What did all nighter say? No, I'm not betting you. You choose the time period, okay? Until I die. How about that? Oh you know? no, I'm not choosing that. I mean, how could I, how can you put a time period on that kind of thing? I can't put a time period on lumber. You know, I mean, I, I don't know when it's going to go back up. When the damn builder sentiment changes, right? That's when it's going to go back up. So, no, I can't, I mean, I'm not going to bet you on something that's just, like, completely, like, you know, so obscured as far as a bet goes. It's not like a finish line. It's not, don't be scared. I ain't scared of shit. Ignore Danny. It's Hunter's Biden with nothing to do. Yeah. Let him cry in all caps. That's so funny. Uneducated, scared boy. All right. Give me the bet, bro. Tell me what the bet is. I mean, is it six months? No, I ain't betting that. Is it a year? No, I ain't betting that. And I ain't betting no timeline either, you know? All right. QE and the Fed's balance sheet isn't part of the circulation of money until quantitative tightening. Five years. All right. If you could tell that you win the lottery. That's right. Meat is a high stakes game. Bad time to buy a house. Gambling isn't a sound investment. Uh, I'm actually getting you some good money. Well, whatever. Yui, if you're confident that you're right, just bet him and get his money. No. You know why? It's because, for one, I don't bet, right? I don't bet on anything. I don't bet my money away. It's a stupid way to spend your money. Now, the other thing is, is that I don't have timelines, right? I can't give you a timeline because a bet has a timeline to it. So no, I'm not going to do any of that stuff. 
Danny is a burger flipper. Yeah. He doesn't have any. He has a $3,000 mortgage. And I'm thinking uh, we will have stagflation for an extended period of time. How about we pick one item? How about we pick one item like uh, something really odd out there? Something that like nobody would ever think of like, you know. But we pick something like... Uh, how about concrete building blocks? 8 by 8 by 16 concrete building blocks. How about that one, Danny? In two years, right? Let's find out whether or not concrete building blocks are going to be more expensive today or less expensive. How about that? You want to do that? Concrete building blocks? You want to take that bet, bro? All right. You want a necessity? No. <laughs> I'm not doing a necessity. It's like doing oil or something like that. Come on, man. All right. That's what I thought, homie. Scared. Yeah, you're scared. You're scared. You're, the reason why you're scared is because I'm right, right? And that's the reason why you're truly scared. See, I ain't scared of shit, man. I ain't scared of anything that goes on out there. I'm not scared about my future of investments. I'm not scared about my job. I'm not scared for this YouTube channel. I'm not scared for my life. I'm not scared in any way, shape, or form. But it sounds like you are, because you are a little bit more into this than you should be. All right. Um, all right. Very good looks. Okay. Actually, you know, what time is it, man? It's two, uh, two hours into this. I really should be bailing out of here. All right. Uh, well pumps are necessities. You belong in Washington State. All right, getting hot in here. Yeah, delete the fool. No, he's okay. He has his right to his opinion. I ain't deleting him. Yeah, I mean the only the only time I will ever delete anybody is if they're being hateful, like actually straight up hateful or spam or something like that. But if you have an opinion that disagrees with me or just straight up like don't even like me, I don't, that's not my that's it's not for me to delete. You know. All right. Love your channel. Well, thank you, Sooner Baron. All right. It's not going to go down. I enjoy your takes and input UE. Keep the great work. You can delete me. I'm getting you money. I'm not deleting you, bro. Hey, you're, yeah, your opinion is just as valid as everybody else's here. Just because I don't agree with it doesn't make it any less valid. Yeah. All right. Stop giving haters the time. Whatever, man. It's, I mean, I don't mean to give a hard time about any of this stuff, but whatever. All right. Uh, I bet rent will go up. Right. How could we not like the dude from GTA 3? UE, bet on condoms for Danny's day today. More house takes. Uh, is your rent going down? Ice cream sandwiches? Let's see here. You, we can't live in an echo chamber. Let's bet on condoms. We can do that. What's the historical basis for 2%? All right. When rent will go down. Take that bet. Me and Simon used to smoke dope together. Keep up the great work. A great perspective every time. The dollar store went up. Mouse traps will inflate when people get hungry. Uh, meat bingo though. Yeah. You we you'll be you'll be scared for your family when your hungry neighbors come over with their loaded guns demanding food, money, and ammo. Again, that is your fear, right? That's not my fear. I don't live that way. Van E, really? You would take that bet? Uh, bull, enough family, dollar, dollar thirty-five. All right, $5. Peter, thank you so much for the $5. I'm about to build a deck now or wait. Cheers. Now. Do it now. Do it now. Your prices for lumber are not going to get much cheaper than they are today. Um, I mean, you might find like a slightly better price but you're not going to find a dramatically better price if nothing if anything you're going to end up waiting and then there will be like a demand for lumber that increases the 
the price of the futures and you'll miss your, your miss out on your opportunity. I really just don't see anywhere going into the future from right now that lumber prices are going to be any cheaper than they are. Um, so, yeah. All right. Okay. So many gamma males. Okay. Okay. Everything is up price from A to Z. Sell the house and buy a new one with a nice deck and real estate falls. Oh, please. Here's the Mad Max BS. Are you familiar with the history of rent prices in the UA, U.S. Van E? The garlic bolognese, $1.25. He has a bunker. Corvette C8. Let's bet that won't go below manufacturer seat. How about lumber futures? How about rice? How about... Um, how about corn futures? How about um let's see what else? Um how about wheat? How about wheat futures? Yes, let's do those. Let's do some some commodity futures like that. And let's compare them to their all time highs and to where they are today. And I'll have already won the bet. So okay. What does anybody shop clearance at stores? Does anybody shop clearance at stores? My deck's built now knocking the fence out. Oh, knocking the fence out, I see. Yeah. Should I have a baby now or wait? Ooh, stranger in the Alps. I would be... I... Having a kid right now is going to be very difficult. So if, unless you are financially prepared to deal with that, it's, I would... I wouldn't... <laughs> Waiting is only going to get worse. Um... The inequality is going to grow. The cost of living is going to get worse. And the conveniences that people enjoy are not going to be conducive to a family. All right. So a singular individual is going to be really the happier person. Right. It's going to be ride sharing and like, I don't know how to quite explain it, but really like i can imagine like going into the future at some point like you know in 10 years or something you would find that most people probably won't own a car they won't own a place to live they'll have renting little tiny spaces to to sleep in or store their stuff in um most like nine to five job kind of things like people won't be looking for that they'll be doing some kind of online sailing sell or like DoorDash type of activity but like going to a nine to five job will be a whole lot less the whole idea of what it is as far as an american family you know like house and kids and and you know the wife and the cars and all that other stuff it's like it's less appealing it's too difficult it's too expensive um and basically being an individual on your own is going to be so much more convenient and easier so i i would say like if you're going to have a kid you might as well have it fast and early you know but it's not going to do well all right all right when food and energy price skyrocks i don't care what inflation numbers are or what necess 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 necessarily caused it it were caused it we are going to get hurt yeah okay so when okay so when the price of gas is cheaper and pork is cheaper and yet you're saying when it's going to get more expensive so I, that's what i'm like a little lost on this everybody is stuck in this inflation scenario like it's going to continue on forever but yet there's all kinds of evidence of it like you know being relieved yeah, you can pick and choose all the stuff that it's being relieved in. You can also pick and choose all the stuff that it's not, right? But what do you see coming from the Federal Reserve? What do you see coming from this from the demand side of things? What do you see coming from the manufacturers out there? All those people, nobody's excited about this economy. And if you don't have transactions, then you have a slowing down of money velocity. And the money velocity is really what's going to cause the inflation as well. You know, when you have money velocity picking up, then you have more dollars changing hands, you have more competition for those transactions and more dollars. You can have, again, like I said, you can have $100 million sitting in the bank, but unless it's out there being used, right, you're out there spending that money, then it just sits in the bank. It doesn't do anything, right? So money velocity is slowing down too. Okay, we can bet on lumber. You got it, man. What's the bet? 
You tell me the bet, and I'll say yay or nay to it. What's the bet on lumber? I got this one, dude. You just screwed yourself, Danny. All uh, right. Totally. Hey, growth and gold supplies got gotcha. you. All right. So you think we have the bottom for lumber? What about everything else? Sorry, I just joined the stream if you already explained. Well, I was just talking about the lumber and the lumber industry and some of the curtailments that we are seeing going on within the production of the lumber industry. Really, it's the builder sentiment that I think once that changes that you're really going to start seeing the futures and the price of lumber start to move back up again. So, yes, yeah, so let's do lumber. Okay, what's the... It won't be cheap. No shit, it's not going to be any cheaper than it is right now, Danny. How come it's as cheap as it is right now? That's what I ask you. How about we bet that? Tell me the reason why it's so cheap. All right? Why don't you explain that one to me? I mean, if inflation has gone into everything and lumber was selling for 400 per thousand back in 2017 and 18, then how come it's not selling for, you know, 800 per thousand now? How come it's at 400? You can't explain that, can you? I'm not betting on it not being cheaper, you dummy. I'm not, I don't mean to call you a dummy. I'm sorry, that wasn't right. Cost of living going up, 100% agree. Okay, another thing we can agree upon. All right. Children are families and liability. The good news is the weed prices. Yeah, weed. How about that? How come weed isn't expensive? I bet you weed won't be any cheaper or any more expensive. It's going to be, I mean, it's about as dirt cheap as it can get right now, right? And I'm sorry, I shouldn't have called you a dummy, dude. That wasn't, I wasn't right. I wasn't trying to be a dick like that. All right, look up Owen Benjamin. I've talked with Owen Benjamin. He's been on my show. All right, I was told that residential rent prices go up in corrections. I have no idea how people are surviving right now. I make 150000 no kids, no expenses, and I still feel poor when looking for a house. Now, we are going into 1930s depression. I hope he doesn't show up this emotional at the rebel capitalist live. People pay thousands for that. I First of all, I'm at the rebel capitalist live just hanging out. I'm not going to be on stage, so... I can act however I want. <laughs> no. All right. And besides, I think it's more about this coffee that I'm drinking right now. I make 130000 and it feels like seventy five in the mid-2000s. Well, I've, you know, I lived forever making $30,000 a year. So now this feels like the best time of my life. Sorry, I mean, I guess it's all perspective, you know? I also bring in, I also try to bring in as much money as I possibly can, which is something I've never done before. So, you know, uh, make them babies. Yeah. All right, All right, Steve, let's see here. The USD has lost 99% of its value since its inception. Can't afford the demand. Greetings from Humongous. Nice. Good to see Lord Humongous up in here. He would agree with Danny. I think I think Lord Humongous would. <laughs> He's a big gold guy. All right, all fiat currencies historically have gone to zero. That's right. But how many fiat currencies have you seen actually establish themselves as a world reserve currency? Right? None. Never. First time in history has any currency ever besides gold been a world reserve currency, like a fiat currency anyway. Right? So this is a brand new game. And when people are saying, yeah, man, the dollar's on its way out, it's going to fail, nobody's going to use it, really, where's the, like, I see the articles all the time. People talk about the dollar losing, losing its world reserve currency status. And so I'm like, okay, that's cool. I can see that. I mean, all fiat currencies fail at some point. What's second place? Name me the second place, the runner up, right? The one that's going to even remotely come close to doing what the dollar is doing right now. There is nothing out there, nothing. Like, even if you wanted it to be and say, hey, that's that right there, you can't even pick it out. Like, what is it? The euro? Gold? They're not even remotely close to doing what the dollar can do or is doing. Like, so, like people say it's on its way out. Yeah, okay, I can believe that. It's going to fail. What's replacing it? Nothing. Nothing is out there to replace it yet. Yeah. I could be wrong, but I don't see how rentals will be able to succeed in home buying gets cheaper in the future. I don't think home buying is going to get that much cheaper. Explaining negative rates in correlation to 2% Fed target. Negative rates in correlation to the 2% Fed target. 
I'm not sure I understand the question. Explain negative rates in correlation to the 2% Fed target. I'm sorry, I don't, I'm not sh quite sure on how you want that question to be answered. Considering quitting my job to be traveling hobo musician might just do it. Dude, that sounds like a great thing, man. I would love to just travel around and just bum it out. All right. It don't go down. Okay, but bear with me. Another Cali bank failure. Central bank digital currencies will prove. In July, dominoes falling. Yeah, there may be a brief deflation as dollars rush home, but then what? Seems real, real tough to figure. Uh, lumber going down makes wood hard. It's not. It's... A land is land a good investment in rural America? Well, land is one of the few things. Um, I I do I do look at land as a good one because land is one of the few things that you're just not going to be making any more of it, right? Like in Dubai, they kind of figured it out, but not really, right? So, the like whatever land is out there is the only land that's going to be available. If you happen to find land that's going to be in the future, like. You know, you find an area that's going to be growing soon and you happen to be on the outskirts of that and you, you know, you buy into some land that's going to be developed soon. That kind of like forward thought and and seeing it, that's, that I think is a good investment even today, you know. All right. Weed is not a necessity. Yeah. Well, it was a, it was a, uh, what do they call the... Remember those jobs that everybody, all our jobs that we got to keep is whatever viable jobs. What are they called? All right, UE is, why is the price of pork down? It's because they overproduced it. They overproduced pork during the pandemic. All these hog farmers were looking at the high price of pork and said, hey, I want to take advantage of that. And they started overproducing the pork because, why? Because that's what happens with the bullwhip effect. And that's the main reason why we've seen pork prices as low as they are. But Danny doesn't want to agree with that. Danny would probably disagree with that one. Uh, all love, brother. No worries. All right, Danny. I really do apologize for that. I really shouldn't have called you that. That's not... That's... That was a really bad slip. All right. Weed is not a necessity either. Yeah, I know it's not. All right. What about 30 milligram perks? What's that? I don't know what that is. Uh, okay. Subprime mortgages was only part of the problem. It was much more complicated than the one scapegoat. But yes, you have the right idea. Gold and silver can go down, but not lumber. UE and Owen Benjamin are the best. Yeah, um, Owen was... He was so much fun to interview. I was a little bit nervous when I, because I had never met him before and I didn't, you know, never talked with him or anything, just a couple of like emails back and forth. Owen was the coolest dude, man. He was so fun to talk to. And then, like, he's a comedian anyway. So, like, he just, like, the interview was just fun as, as could be. It was like he, I mean, he had me laugh and I'm sure he had everybody else who was watching laughing too. So. All uh, right. Uh, I learned long ago from the fabulous furry freak brothers. Weed will get you through times of no money better than money will get you through times of no weed. Yeah. Black market, Danny. It's a shame they dri dividing us poor's with he whole credit rate fees. Zach, you're right. Sorry for the spelling. Herb is a great barter tool. What do you think will happen to lending? I, What do I think will happen to lending? I think lending is going to get very tight. Like, you know, the t lending standards are anyway. And that's for the next, at least for the next year or so. Um, you know, it's just like the impacts of the Fed funds rates moving into the economy because of that lag period, it's just gonna be very, very difficult for banks to be profitable going into the future. Considering that a lot of people are gonna be pulling, once they pull their deposits out, that leaves the banks in a very tough position with their assets that they have on their balance sheet because their assets on their balance sheet, this is really kind of difficult to understand too, 
is that basically it's loans, right? So the banks have loans out there. These loans are anywhere from like things like U.S. Treasuries, like the, you know, loaning it to the government, to loans for you and me to buy a house or something like that. Those are the assets that sit on their balance sheet. Now, like when it comes to a U.S. Treasury, when the yields go up, the prices fall. Okay, so as the yields were rising on, you know, from the Fed funds and causing the U.S. Treasuries to rise, these banks, they have these U.S. Treasuries. Now, if they held on to the to the Treasuries to maturity, then everything's cool. Like they get back their money, the principal plus the interest on it. However, if they need to sell some of those assets in order to acquire some funding, some money. The, when the interest rates go up, the prices go down. Now what they can sell those assets for is not what they pay for them. They take them at, they sell them off at a loss. And this is really where a lot of these banks are suffering right now is that a lot of these assets that are sitting on their balance sheet are not worth what they could sell them for in order to cover what their balance sheet. Does that kind of make sense? Because they were worth, you know, up here, but then when the interest rates, you know, rise, the asset prices fall. Now what they can sell them for is a lot less. They can hold on to them for maturity, but if they need funding right now, they're out of funding. They don't have it, right? So they're only going to lend only to the most, you know, highest, you know, quality, creditworthy people out there. And then in order to acquire some funding, the Federal Reserve had set up a new facility, right? That's only for, you know, during this crisis, during this banking crisis, where they can take those treasuries that they have and instead of selling them, they can use those as collateral to borrow money from the Federal Reserve. And this is one of the reasons why I think the balance sheet on the Federal Reserve is moving up. <sighs> anyway. <laughs> All right. I think we can all agree in this room that the price of items have gone higher than it should be because the Fed. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. We can agree with that. There's two things that are happening there, right? You got to add, you got to also add the government, but I can really like, I don't even like including government in anything, but yes, we can agree between those two actions, the severing of the supply chain and the stimulus packages that were you know sent out there that's what caused the inflation to go on, right? If we're going to have continual inflation, we'd have to see a broken supply chain forever, right? And stimulus packages continuing to go out. And I just don't see that happening. But yes, we can agree that it was the Fed. Uh, and I'm sure we can all agree that we should end the Fed. Yeah. All right. You always sleep on the Swiss franc. You, you always sleep on the Swiss franc. Oh, and like not talk about it much as far as being like the World Reserve Bank and or being a bank for the world or something like that. Um, I think probably it's because it's not used inside of a inside of such an amount of like global transactions that it's going to be considered a world reserve currency. Now, it is a safe haven to park money like, uh, you know, away. But it's not necessarily like a transactor of, of tran you know, being a transaction. You know, that's not what the, that bank does. That's what the SWIFT is all about, the SWIFT and what the BRICS are trying to set up. That's what those guys are doing is that communication network. That's not something that the Swiss, Swiss banks do. They're more of like a safe haven place, you know, to be. And that's what the question was about. All right, this is a long live stream. It is, and I'm going to go because I think my battery's about, yeah, it's at 10%, and I was really only going to be out here for a couple of hours, but Danny got me all worked up. All right, uh, USD is losing its standing as a world currency due to Ukraine. No, it's not. No, it's not, okay? And the reason, in, it's easy to see by just looking for the second place, looking for the runner-up. <clears throat> Who's the runner-up to the dollar? No one. There's nobody there. There's not even like, even if you wanted to pick it out and say, there it is, that's, there's nothing there. There's nobody there who's a second place to the dollar. And then we also have to think, what is it that's going to happen that's going to cause the dollar to lose that world reserve currency status? And there's two things that have to happen. One of them is somebody has to come up with a safe and liquid asset like the U.S. Treasuries. And we just even, even recently found where Russia, who is getting yuan, can't really use the yuan for anything. They sell those yuans for dollars. We just recently did a video talking about that. So even the Russian, China, hate the U.S. is still getting into U.S. dollars at the end of the day. Okay? Why? Because the U.S. dollar is the only thing out there. There's nothing else. Okay? At some point, it will change. 
at some point china may issue out enough us or not, uh, not may issue out enough debt to be com to be in competition with the safe and liquid asset like the us treasury but then how does yuan get out to the world like how is it that china is intending on printing up enough money and injecting that into the world to allow them to use it for a world reserve currency. How is that going to happen? They're a manufacturing state. That means they import stuff. They sell stuff and they import money, right? They export their stuff and import money. The United States sells debt and then buys stuff from the world, right? That's how they're able to get the money out to the rest of the world is by borrowing it and then, sell, and then sending them that money and taking their stuff. And so there's nobody else who can do that. Like, I mean, if there was somebody else even coming close to it, it would be like, oh, man, that's going to do it. What China's going to do is they're going to try and figure out a way to get new money coming into the system. It's going to piss us off and we're all going to go to war for it, right? Because we're going to want to sell debt and they're going to want to, like, take over the commodities of other nations and stuff. And it's going to be a very fierce battle over it. Because if they can take over those commodities and they can get those countries to sell it in, you know, whatever country, whatever currency they want. And that's where the United States is going to flip out about it, at least in my opinion. Wheat is overproduced because legalization also acted as a government subsidy. What? No, it didn't. It didn't act as a government subsidy. What it did is it made the free market show real prices, right? That's what it did, right? Because wheat is useless. Wheat is a useless commodity. Like, beer... I would I would totally disagree with like I say beer is a is a valuable thing that you can actually make some money with because not everybody knows how to brew beer. In fact, you could take a brewer and give somebody and tell hey man, tell this guy how to brew beer. And that brewer can give that person instructions right down to the letter perfectly. Like and that person could follow those instructions by every letter not miss a single beat, right? and produce beer that doesn't taste anything like the guy who has told him how to do it. Like a true brew, brewer craftsman is a skill. Like that is something you have to know how to do. You have to be practiced at it. You have to understand it in order to brew good beer. I've seen people throw a handful of seeds behind the shed and forget about it and grow killer weed. Like it takes no intelligence to grow weed, none whatsoever. It's a damn plant that does grows any asshole can do it right so brew is much different than it is weed and so weed doesn't have any value to it like you can grow as much as of it you want it doesn't like take any kind of special skills it does take special skill to like grow a quantity of good weed like you know to grow a really nice quality plant it does but it doesn't take any kind of real effort to grow a usable plant it's just it's it's easy to do and when everybody does it and there's no law against it, then you have a flood, a sea of green, and the value of it is nothing. It's pretty much worthless. The only thing that really gives wheat any kind of value is the process, right? So if you're processing it into concentrate, you're processing it into edibles, you process it into something else, well, then you might have something that you can sell there. But the actual plant itself, like the flower, a bud, it's useless. There's nothing there. There is no value to it, you know? Uh, okay, I think we can all agree in this room that the price of items have gone higher than it should be because the Fed, that's the point I'm trying to say. Okay, so everything except for lumber and silver and rice, right? And none of those things, right? All those major commodities that everybody uses, and oil, right? None of those things went up because of the Fed. I mean, the four most common things that were probably used around the world are like at 50% of their all time highs or less. And that's not because of the Fed, right? But everything else that had high prices, that was the Fed's fault, but not, not those four items. See, it doesn't make sense to me. Like I don't, I, I can't, I can't even like, you know, wrap my head around how that, you know, how your argument is supposed to work. You know? Cause I mean, I could see it. If it was the money printer go burr and prices go up because of the money printer, then everything across the board would have gone up and not a single item would have gone down, nothing. Like, we would have not seen oil come down, we wouldn't have seen lumber come down, we wouldn't have seen rice come down, we wouldn't see wheat come down, we wouldn't have seen any other stuff come down. Like, nothing. It all would have stayed elevated, and it would have remained elevated, right? But how come it came down? Explain that one. How, explain those four items to me and why they came down. Okay? 
All right, do you think they will crash gold and silver from all the people taking their retirement out of the stock market and moving it into gold and silver backed IRAs? Uh, no, I don't, because I just don't think enough people are actually doing that. I mean, I could talk to probably 50 people in a row outside of like my YouTube channel, but just 50 people out there in general in my town. And I would be very surprised to find any of them buying gold and silver. Right? Very few people actually do it. The real dollar is minted, not printed. Yeah, I can agree with that. Right. Zion Putin said there will be 100 years of change very soon. So I guess we'll see. We will. All right. All love from here, all love here from me, UE, and I are Oregonian homies, and we just need a quick 30 MG perk, and we'd be loving life. <laughs> yeah, I think Danny's cool enough. We, I mean, I did get kind of lit up there, but Danny's cool. So, I mean, anybody who's willing to come out here on the channel and give an opinion and be as adamant about it, hey man, I mean that's that's respect, you know. I mean, you know, you're you're sticking to your guns and I can believe in that. All right. Uh I call people way worse than dummies. Yeah. <laughs> I know, but I'm not I'm that's not the way I want to be, you know. I'm not somebody who calls people names, you know. Especially when I get like, you know, lit up or frustrated or something. That's not right. If you if you call them people names and you're losing your fight, right? You're losing your 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 argument. So uh, is it possible for home prices to flash crash like other assets have done? No, I don't think so. Like what would cause a flash crash? Like a flash crash is what people are like all of a sudden freaking out and throwing, just getting out of it for any reason. Like I'm not, <clears throat> I, like if price, the house prices fall, I'm not, I'm like, I'm, I'm there, man. I'm not going anywhere. And I think a lot of other people are that way too, especially those who have very low interest rates on their loans. Like they are not giving that up. They are stuck there and they will stick to it no matter what. Then if you also think about it, rents have gone up so dramatically in the last year that most rents that I'm finding out there now are as much as my house payment is. So like if you take that kind of consideration into stuff, there's really no position in which that people would be like willing to just dump their house out right now for any price. And that's what would cause the flash crash or all like these institutional investors go bankrupt at the same time and need to dump their assets. Right. Then that might create a flash crash kind of scenario. But other than that, like, how would how would a flash crash occur? Like, it would be people literally trying to sell their house for any price they can get it. And I don't see that scenario. Like, I don't know why that would occur. You know? Am I missing? There it is. All right. Thank you, Van E, for the $2. We did gold and silver audit, like 10 nickel, excuse me. Yeah, that would be an interesting one to see, a, a gold and silver audit. I'd like to see the Fed audit it all together. Oh, no. Alrighty, guys, I think I got to go. My phone is about ready to die on me. I was just going to see if there was any other super chats that I didn't answer. There is right there. Uh, it was $19 uh, from Sooner Bear. Thank you. My phone is just, the screen is just one dark. I can barely see it. So I'm going to have to go, guys. I hope I didn't miss any super chats. Thank you, Danny, for hanging out and having the discussion with me. Thank you, everybody who hung out here through this live stream. I really appreciate it. Thank you, everybody who sent me a super chat. You guys are always so generous with the channel and donating and supporting the channel. I really appreciate everything you guys do for me. Uh, if you're going to be in Orlando, try and check out the Rebel Capitalist. I'm going to be there hanging out with George Gammon and the crew and doing all the fun economic forum stuff that we do over there. All right. Uneducated economist. You guys let me know.